we have almost worked on it and we are doing it. We have the attendees. Of, just a minute, just give us two minutes. A very good afternoon to everyone. Um, we're sorry for some technical issues. I think uh, we will be able we have almost solved it and we will be able to start the sessions. Uh, Dr. Manas is there. Dr. Manas is coming. Okay. Uh, uh, thank you for joining in and welcome you on the third day of the session. I hope you are participating from the clinically relevant cases that you are attending for the last few days. Today, our whole session is devoted to diabetes. I'm sure you are seeing lots of patients of diabetic ketoacidosis and managing lots of patients of diabetes in routine practice. Uh, we will take you from the diabetic ketoacidosis to the routine management of diabetes and uh, frequently asked questions that you face daily and also psychological aspects of diabetes. Our first session is by uh, Dr. Ravi and I am really thankful to Dr. Ravi for accepting my invite to enlighten us on diabetic ketoacidosis. Now I invite our coordinator, Dr. Manas, to begin the session by inviting the chairperson. Dr. Shobhna is here. Um, a very good afternoon and uh, congratulations to North Delhi IAP, Dr. Richard, Dr. Dinesh, Dr. Shalini, who have put in this immense effort of doing this endocon. And tirelessly, they have been working and doing a really a stupendous job to organize this meeting. Uh, so for today's uh, discussion on diabetes, first of all, I would like to invite the chairpersons. We have Dr. Shobhana Gupta, who is a very integral member of North Delhi IAP. Uh, she is a senior pediatrician at Sabdarjung Hospital and also in charge of the newborn uh, defect registry over there. We also have Dr. Praveen Kumar. He's a very senior pediatrician at Panipat. I would invite both of them to come and chair the session and take the proceedings further. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, so here uh, we are here in, uh, today afternoon. We are here again for a very important session on diabetic ketoacidosis, which is a very important medical emergency. We all see in a day to day practice in our ER. So as we all know, the prompt management and treatment actually can save the life of the child. Uh, if proper care can be taken. So for that, we have with us a very eminent uh, pediatric gastro uh, endocrinologist, Dr. Ravi uh, Kumar uh, from Chennai. Uh, he has done his post-graduation from the All India Institute of Medical Sciences, and he is currently working as a pediatric uh, endocrinologist in a child trust hospital. So over to you, Dr. Ravi Kumar, sir. And uh, uh, we're hopeful for a good informative session for you. Over to Dr. Ravi Kumar. So, are you able to share the slides? Sorry, I, I missed uh, you for some time. My connection got disconnected. Um, I'll try and share the screen. No issues. No issues. Okay, are you able to see the screen yeah, now? Yeah, yeah, we are able to see the screen. Okay, can I start? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay, okay. Uh, so thank the organizers for this opportunity. A very good afternoon to everyone. So the talk now is management of diabetic ketoacidosis, uh, which is a very common problem. And as a pediatrician, I'm sure you would encounter uh, in your day-to-day -day practice uh, quite frequently. 
Uh, today's discussion is going to be about a case-based management of diabetic ketoacidosis and the various DKA protocols that we have. And the last ISPID protocol, 2018 protocol, uh, ISPID has come up with the three protocols, the last one in 2018. So what is different in this protocol? So is there any learning points and the take home messages from this protocol? Management of DKA by subcutaneous insulin. So that's a new concept, which is very much relevant during COVID times. So we are going to uh, look into all these issues. Various protocols have been uh, there for management of diabetic ketoacidosis. Most postgraduate students will be aware of the Milwaukee protocol, which is mentioned in the Nelson textbook of pediatrics, which is actually from Children's Hospital of Wisconsin, uh, which is the original one that most of us were following. And then the British Society of Pediatric Endocrinology and Diabetes, BSPAD, came up with their own uh, protocols from 1994 onwards until 2002. The beginning of 2002, they came up with the consensus guidelines. Now, uh, that was well received all over the world. And following that, the International Society um, for uh, uh, Pediatric and Adolescent Diabetes, ISPAD Society, came up with their own uh, consensus guidelines in 2009 and 2014, and then recently in 2018. So as we go, we'll go through what are the differences. Now, just uh, a few points. Uh, hello? Uh, the, the last consensus guideline, 2018 guideline, uh, is uh, emphasizing more on flexible fluid and insulin administration with the emphasis on variability of presentation and titrate the insulin and the fluid according to clinical condition. A detailed description of hyperglycemic, hyperosmolar state is given and along with hyperosmolar coma, probably because of uh, more uh, incidence of type 2 diabetes that we have started seeing now with acanthosis and the more incidence of hyperglycemic, hyperosmolar uh, state. And then it goes into detail about analysis of causes of persistent acidosis and how to avoid hyperchloremia. Now we'll go into a, a, a case a six-year-old uh, girl child who was previously well has come with the polyuria and the polydipsia for 10 days, fever for two days, increasing tiredness and weight loss. A private lab, they have done some investigation which showed urine glucose of one plus, which was ignored. Uh, they thought it is not significant. Urine ketones are not mentioned in this uh, in that report. Subsequently, child was admitted to a local hospital where urea, creatinine, electrolytes, CBC, they all done and they were all normal. Vida, lepto, um, uh, MP, man to chest X-ray they were all done and the child was being treated with antibiotics and IV fluids with a suspected sepsis. Now this is a very common scenario that a child uh, presents to a local hospital with a fever and maybe vomiting and uh, maybe some altered sensorium um, and uh, they're being uh, treated with IV fluids and, um, and antibiotics. So what is the mistake uh, being done here? So it's a very common problem and this mistake is very common. First of all, the glucose is not ordered uh, or the dextrosics is not done. Often the urine glucose takes of one plus two plus is not very reliable in this scenario and the better to do a proper glucose, a blood glucose level. Then subsequently, this child was uh, shifted to a higher center because of se severe respiratory uh, distress. In the emergency room, the child had a small breathing with a low uh, Glasgow coma scale. Glucose was very high, 693 ketones, very high. Bicarbonate was low. 3, pH of 6.8, child was intubated and shifted to PICU. Now we're going to look at this uh, case in more detail. What is the diagnosis and how commonly is it misdiagnosed? So most of you can tell that this is the case of diabetic ketoacidosis and in a newly diagnosed diabetes, late diagnosis is very common. And it is a late diagnosis that is uh, the leading cause of diabetic ketoacidosis because these children are variously treated with the query sepsis, query asthma, wheezing. They often get nebulizations. They often get a lot of investigations uh, before uh, somebody uh, diagnoses that they're actually in diabetic ketoacidosis. Often stress hyperglycemia can present similarly, although you don't have that much degree of acidosis and HbA1c levels often are normal. Let's go into the definition of diabetic ketoacidosis. The biochemical criteria for the diagnosis of diabetic ketoacidosis are hyperglycemia, that is blood glucose of more than 200 milligrams per dl, and a VNS pH of less than 7.3 or a serum bicarbonate less than 15, along with the ketonemia or ketonuria. What is the severity? Is it mild, moderate, or severe? So how do we assess this? Now, the severity of DKA can be mild, moderate, severe, 
according to venous ph and bicarbonate if the venous ph is less than 7.1 and the bicarbonate less than 5 it is severe if the venous ph is less than 7.2 and the bicarbonate less than 10 it is moderate if the ph is less than 7.3 and the bicarbonate less than 17 it can be termed as mild dka what is the treatment now we should initiate for this particular child and what is the fluid type and what amount of fluid should be given so the guidelines from ispad uh, protocol or initial fluids depends whether the child presents in shock or not if the child presents in shock rapidly restore the circulatory volume with isotonic saline 0.9% saline or ringer lactate in 20 ml per kg boluses infused as quickly as possible this is for shock if the child presents without shock then it depends whether there is a poor uh, perfusion tissue perfusion or a normal tissue perfusion the tissue perfusion is normal volume expansion with a 0.9% saline can be given at a rate of 10 ml per kg over a period of 30 to 60 minutes whereas if poor tissue perfusion was evident then volume expansion the same amount it's a 10 ml per kg 0.9% there's no difference in that but you infuse it over a period of 15 to 30 minutes as opposed to 30 to 60 minutes so you can infuse it fairly rapidly if there is a poor tissue perfusion and another important thing if there's a to poor tissue perfusion repeat this same amount until perfusion is restored this is very important whereas in this case normal tissue per perfusion you are not supposed to repeat the fluid bolus as giving too much fluid excessive fluid is one of the causes of uh, cerebral edema so you should be very cautious you can see how they differentiate shock poor perfusion and normal perfusion so the child can present in various mod modalities of de dehydration and shock and accordingly the initial fluids would vary subsequent fluid management depends on the progress and the sodium content uh, by this time you would have the sodium result uh, sent from the lab so you you can have a look at that the guidelines are 0.45% to 0.9% saline or ringer lactate or plasma light should be continued higher sodium content fluid can be continued if serum uh, sodium is low and expected sodium raise is not present sodium raise should normally be 0.5 millimole per liter for every 1 millimole per liter decrease in glucose concentration now you would know 1 millimole per liter is 18 mg per dl of glucose urinary losses should not routinely be added to the calculation of replacement fluid how long uh, the fluid should be corrected this is a good question various protocols have over a period of time given various uh, timelines the original nelson protocol milwaukee protocol used to say 23 hours for some reason 23 they chose whereas ispad from the beginning they have been saying 48 hours although the reason protocol if you see again it goes to 24 to 48 hours the hourly rate is calculated by using this formula where you calculate the 48 hours maintenance requirement plus deficit minus resuscitation fluid already given the whole thing divided by 48 that gives you the hourly rate of the fluid that has to be administered now we'll come to the insulin when should insulin be started how much insulin should be started how long after the iv fluids insulin therapy should be started 1 hour after starting fluid replacement therapy iv insulin bolus should not be given because that is a risk factor for cerebral edema dose of insulin is 0.05 to 0.1 unit per kg per hour how to prepare the insulin solution as you of you all know take a 50 ml syringe and the 50 ml syringe take 50 ml normal saline and then add 50 units of regular or soluble insulin this will give you 1 ml will give you 1 unit of uh, regular insulin 0.05 unit per kg per hour is as effective as 0.1 unit per kg per hour here i must emphasize that in 2009 protocol the first ispd protocol the dose they recommended was 0.1 subsequent protocols they have st started saying you can give either 0.05 or up to 0.1 unit per kg per hour anything in between using 0.1 unit per kg per hour is not shown to be harmful and in various studies 0.05 is as effective as a 0.1 unit per kg per hour so it doesn't really matter but subsequently it depends on what the glucose uh, decrease is what is the sodium level depending on that you can titrate the adjust the dose of insulin that seems to be the emphasis now in the current protocol that you titrate the dose of insulin you titrate the fluid being given according to the clinical condition so obviously the ispd recognizes the variability of the presentation and not all children present with the same amount of dehydration and shock so one should constantly evaluate these children clinically and take a decision uh, dynamically 
the dose of insulin should usually remain at a 0.05 to 0.1 unit per kg per hour at least until the resolution of dka that is ph of more than 7.3 serum bicarbonate more than 15 bohb beta hydroxybutyric acid less than 1 or closure of anion gap until this is achieved the same amount of insulin should be continued now we will come to the potassium supposing the child has not passed urine after 2 hours and the potassium is 2.7 will you add potassium or not the general consensus is if the child has not passed urine then it could be a sign of acute renal failure so you should hold off uh, in giving potassium until the child has passed urine but supposing if the potassium is already low that is 2.7 will you still go ahead and give the potassium so what does the ispad say the ispad say if the patient is hypokalemic start potassium replacement at the time of initial volume expansion and before starting insulin therapy otherwise start replacing potassium after the initial volume expansion and concurrent with the starting insulin therapy if the patient is hyperkalemic then only defer the potassium replacement therapy until urine output is documented because initially if there's no urine output you just wait for volume expansion and see after volume expansion there is any urine output you can still correct the hypokalemia uh, according to the guidelines coming to the antibiotics this particular child is having a white cell count of 23600 so doesn't mean should we start antibiotics what does the ispad protocol say high white cell count can be due to dka start antibiotics only a fever but it also says use clinical judgment with regard to these uh, comorbidities and other uh, the predisposing factors there could be underlying sepsis so that should not be uh, ignored use your clinical judgment the bicarbonate uh, is 2 in this case with a ph of 6.8 is there any role for bicarbonate therapy now we know that bicarbonate should not should not be given as it can cause uh, it can predispose to cerebral edema and it can cause intracellular acidosis however there are some rare indications where you can still give bicarbonate one of them is severe acidosis with a ph of less than 6.9 with a decreased cardiac contractility and a life threatening hyperkalemia now these situations are very rare so in a common uh, clinical practice it's very uh, rarely that we ever have to give bicarbonate therapy eight of eight hours after treatment the glucose levels are decreasing but the sodium level is also decreasing from 140 to 136 what does it mean the child is getting 0.9% saline should we make any changes to the treatment now we know that sodium level should raise as the glucose level is decreasing uh, a useful way is to calculate a corrected sodium level corrected sodium is measured sodium plus 2 into plasma glucose minus 100 divided by 100 mg per dl this is a formula that you can use to correct the um, the correct sodium uh, the corrected sodium level should raise as the glucose level is decreasing if not it is a risk factor for cerebral edema so in this case if the sodium level is not uh, increasing in fact it is decreasing so what should you do first of all reassess the hydration status and the fluid calculation redo the fluid calculation remember do not over hydrate this child you may be giving too much fluid than the amount of dehydration so look at the status of dehydration and correct the fluid very gradually continue with the 0.9% uh, sodium chloride uh, solution however keep mannitol and 3% sodium chloride near the bedside with all the doses and everything written up in case of the any first warning of cerebral edema like headache or uh, vomiting or uh, any other uh, ophthalmoplegia for example or any other signs you should start mannitol or 3% sodium chloride immediately so all the doses should be written up and the me the medication should be kept near the bedside ready to be given at any time do not decrease the glucose levels too rapidly decrease the insulin infusion if required now the same child 10 hours later the glucose is dropped to 150 so what are the changes to the management we are supposed to do are we supposed to reduce the insulin are we supposed to add 5% glucose or can we do both what does the ispad protocol say now look whether it's a normal drop in glucose a normal drop in glucose is as you are treating the diabetic ketoacidosis there's going to be a gradual drop in the glucose which is expected which is what we want that is that drop should be less than 90 mg per dl per hour and that is happening you just add 5% glucose to iv fluids and make it 0.9 gns when the glucose Has come to 250 to 300 mg per dl however if there is a rapid drop which is defined as more than 90 mg per dl per hour uh, see if there is any acidosis still persistent or if the acidosis is corrected if the acidosis is corrected you have to decrease the insulin infusion if the acidosis is not corrected add 5% glucose and you may sometimes need 10% at 12.5% glucose also uh, typically if the acidosis is still not corrected and you are not able to decrease the insulin infusion in some cases you 
you may have to do both. So remember that it has to be titrated uh, with your use of clinical judgment and according to the patient, um, the management should subsequently be titrated. Now we will come to the transition to subcutaneous insulin. When can we introduce subcutaneous insulin? The answer to that is when the DK is corrected and when the child is tolerating oral feeds. However, basal uh, insulin like Glargen can be given even before DK correction. And this has been shown to decrease the, um, to, to improve the recovery from DKA much quicker. Uh, ideally, you choose a meal time and to give a short acting or rapid acting insulin plus or minus a basal insulin, give food and then stop the insulin and then stop the IV fluid. So this is a sequence. So in this table, I have described uh, how to go about starting uh, giving food, stopping IV insulin and IV fluids. If you are going for regular insulin like Actrapid, you can give food, um, uh, you can first give the injection then give the food 20 to 30 minutes later and then stop the IV insulin one to two hours later and stop IV fluids when tolerating oral. However, if you're giving analog insulin like Lispro or Aspart, then uh, you can give food five to 10 minutes after giving the injection, stop IV insulin 15 to 30 minutes later and stop the IV fluids when tolerating oral. I hope this is clear. Now we'll come to the same case. The child has developed a sudden decrease in consciousness with a low GCS. Could this be cerebral edema? How to diagnose it? Do you need a CT scan? Remember, the CT scan is required only after the treatment for cerebral edema is started. Don't rush for a CT scan. In fact, you should actually start treating cerebral edema with a mannitol or 3% sodium chloride and rule out uh, CT is only to rule out other causes. Cerebral edema can be diagnosed by a major criterion, minor criterion, diagnostic criterion. We don't have to go into all this detail, but let us see whether could it have been prevented. The answer is yes and no. Uh, why uh, no? Cerebral edema pathogenesis is incompletely understood. We don't have proper evidence to say what causes cerebral edema. There is no evidence of an association between rate of fluid or sodium administration used in the treatment of DKA and the development of cerebral edema. So no treatment strategy can be definitely recommended as being superior. And similarly, no protocol can be considered superior to other protocols. So basically, we don't have any evidence. So yes, it can be prevented. And no, it, can, it sometimes cannot be prevented. What are the risk factors for cerebral edema? These are all given in ESPAD. I'm sure you know, greater hypocapnia at the time of presentation, higher urea uh, at the time of presentation, severe acidosis, giving bicarbonate, um, when the sodium level is not raising appropriately, giving too much of fluid and giving a big dose of insulin. These are all the risk factors. Coming to the different protocols and guidelines, what are the different guidelines for treatment of DKA? What are the take home message from the recent ESPAD guidelines? As I already uh, shown you, these are the different protocols available. I've already compared the Milwaukee protocol mentioned in the Nelson textbook of pediatrics, which was actually written up in 1988. Initial bolus 10 to 20 ml per kg, insulin 0.05 to 0.1, correct the uh, dehydration over 23 hours, start fluid and insulin together, and you can lower the insulin infusion once the hypoglycemia resolves, and you have to give 0.9% for one hour, and then you can change. Whereas the IESPAD, which started in 2009, 2014, 2018, Different protocols, various protocols have got amended these uh, uh, these protocol uh, these guidelines. Initial bolus varies from 20 ml per kg to 10 ml per kg, depending on shock is present or not. Insulin dose is the same. Correction is done over 48 hours. Fluid and insulin start insulin one to two hours after start of fluids. Continue insulin until resolution of DKA, not earlier. Continue 0.9 percent at least four hours and preferably for up to 12 hours. Despite the 2018 protocol, the latest one, what is different? What are the takeaways? Insulin dose be flexible. The flexible range is 0.05 to 0.1 unit per kg per hour. And increase the dose beyond 0.1 unit per kg also, if there is persistent ketoacidosis and a poor glucose fall. Uh, this particular problem we can en encounter if there is sepsis or the child has been given steroids or the child is very obese where you may suspect insulin resistance or the child is of a pubertal age where because of the pubertal hormones, there may be insulin resistance. In these cases, you may have to give a higher dose of insulin infusion. Whereas if the child is very young and very sensitive to uh, the insulin, you may have to decrease the insulin infusion to even below 0.05 to avoid a rapid fall in sodium concentration.
The sodium uh, fluid that has to be given varies from 0.45 to 0.9%. Uh, the, the emphasis seems to be to avoid hyperchloremia. Hyperchloremic acidosis is now recognized as a quite an important uh, uh, comorbidity that comes after treatment of DKA. So if you see the current protocol, it mentions plasma light and ringer lactate from the beginning. If you use plasma light, plasma light basically contains less amount of chloride. So there is a less risk of uh, hyperchloremic metabolic acidosis. If there is persistent acidosis, look at the causes. It could be persistent ketosis, lactic acidosis, which can happen in sepsis and a poor uh, tissue per perfusion, and hyperchloremia. Detailed description of hyperosmolar hyperglycemic state is, uh, is given in this protocol with all the presentation and treatment. And it also says about mixed picture of HHS and DKA, which is often called hyperosmolar DKA, how to treat it. And then subcutaneous insulin, how to treat DKA with uh, subcutaneous insulin. We'll go into one by one uh, as much as possible. The hyperglycemic hyperosmolar state can be defined when the plasma glucose is more than 600 milligrams per dl, arterial pH more than 7.3, that is there is no acidosis, bicarbonate more than 15, small amount of ketonuria, you don't have much ketonuria in this. The effective serum osmolality is more than 320 and there is often uptendation, that is why it used to be called a coma, hyperosmolar, hyperglycemic coma, uh, so there has to be some uptendation. 2% of youth can have this problem and it can come as part of type 2 diabetes, so look out for acanthosis. The incidence uh, uh, is going to increase now because we see more and more obese children with a more and more risk of uh, type 2 diabetes. So we may, we're going to see more uh, either plain HHS or a combined HHS and DKA uh, like hyperosmolar DKA. In this table, I have given some differences of management of DKA hyperglycemic hyperosmolar state and a combined picture which is hyperosmolar DKA. So this uh, table I have just uh, uh, took out from, it. the table is not given in ISPAT protocol, but going into the detail, I've made this table myself. So if you see the pathology in DKA, there is more ketosis. In HHS, there is more lactic acidosis because of lack of tissue perfusion, whereas ketones may be absent or very mild. In hyperosmolar DKA, you're gonna have both. Initial fluids in DKA is a cautious fluid replacement. HHS is a liberal fluid as a first-line treatment, hyperosmolar cautious fluid replacement. Dehydration you assume is 8% in DKA, whereas HHS state you assume a very high dehydration up to 15%. Hyperosmolar somewhere in between. Urine output replacement is not recommended for DKA, whereas it has to be given, urine, urine output has to be replaced in hyperglycemic, hyperosmolar state, and it should not be taken into account for hyperosmolar. DKA. Insulin dose is almost same for all these conditions, um, except in, uh, sorry, the hyperosmolar, hyper, there's a mistake here. The insulin dose is much less, is actually 0 .0, uh, 0.02 to 0.05 unit per kg per hour. Starting of insulin in DKA one hour after fluid. Now HHS, you try only fluid initially. Start insulin only if glucose is not, follow, uh, is not follow, falling. And that may take uh, six hours, 10 hours, 12 hours, it doesn't matter. Start insulin only if glucose is not falling. Hyperosmolar DKA one hour after fluid. Insulin titration, standard titration as we already described. HHS cautious to avoid rapid fall, not more than 75 milligrams per hour fall in glucose. And the hyperosmolar DKA also cautious uh, decrease in the glucose is recommended. Measurement of glucose, what does the recent uh, protocol say? Although not universally available, uh, beta hydroxybutyric acid concentration should be measured whenever possible. A level more than three is indicative of DKA. A level of less than one is indicative of resolution. And always think about other causes of uh, acidosis like lactic acidosis and hyperchloremic metabolic acidosis. Coming to hyperchloremic metabolic acidosis, it can result when large amounts of chloride rich fluids uh, are used combined with uh, decreased uh, renal excretion um, of uh, chloride um, um, may be associated with the rapid uh, development of hyperchloremia and metabolic acidosis. This can be defined when the ratio of chloride to soda, uh, sodium is more than 0 0.79. The other way to um, to define this in the previous protocols, you might, you might remember the difference between sodium and the chloride, that is sodium minus chloride, it should normally be 32. And uh, it used to say that whenever the sodium minus chloride is less than 30, you think about a hyperchloremic metabolic acidosis. But that definition is not there in the current guideline, where it rather says you, you can, def, uh, norm, uh, it says some kind of formula, it gives us some kind of formula where chloride minus induced base deficit equal to plasma sodium minus plasma chloride minus uh, 
32. This gives an indication whether the child is having hyperchloremic uh, metabolic acidosis. Now coming to the treatment of DKA with the subcutaneous insulin, this is particularly important during COVID times. We ourselves have treated uh, quite many children with uh, subcutaneous insulin in DKA because of lack of bed availability and lack of ICU uh, availability. This is very useful in children who present in uncomplicated diabetic ketoacidosis. Hourly or two hourly subcutaneous uh, or rapid acting uh, or analog, uh, rap, analog can, can be given. It's as effective as IV regular insulin infusion. I've given in this table three different types of uh, protocol that is recommended. One is the hourly rapid insulin, two hourly rapid insulin, short acting insulin. Hourly rapid is Lispro or Aspart and it is given hourly, obviously. Bolus dose is 0 0.3 unit per kg, and then followed one hour later, 0 0.1 unit per kg every hour. When it comes to two hourly rapid uh, acting uh, the insulin, it's either Lispro or Aspart. It is given two hourly or sometimes three hourly. Here again, you give a bolus of 0 0.3 unit per kg. One hour later, 0 0.15 to 0 0.2 uh, unit per kg every two to three hours. Uh, the same treatment can be made with short acting uh, that is a regular uh, type of insulin, but here four hourly injections can be given. No bolus is recommended here. The dose can be calculated by using this formula 0 0.8 to 1 unit per kg per day. Divide that into six equal amounts and then give it every four hourly. So this typically is act rapid, which was not mentioned in earlier protocols. And previously we used to think only Lispro or Aspart. So in fact, even regular um, uh, insulin can, can be used. Uh, to treat diabetic ketoacidosis that is uncomplicated, mild or moderate diabetic ketoacidosis um, with the subcutaneous insulin. So we'll come to the end of it. Uh, thank you very much uh, for your patient listening. If there are any questions, I will take it. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Avikumar, for a very comprehensive view on this complicated uh, topic of, and very important topic of diabetic ketoacidosis. Uh, uh, before uh, we have, uh, I just wanted to ask one thing, Doctor Ravi: Is there an increased risk of uh, diabetic ketoacidosis in a child suffering with COVID? The COVID is known to trigger uh, trigger diabetes, uh, particularly obese individuals. It can trigger type two diabetes. Uh, so, but we have not seen any increase in incidence in our hospital in the last six months. Whatever we have seen is the usual incidence. Uh, um, so, I can't uh, say that we have, we have documented any increase in the incidence. Okay, thank you. Uh, in the chat box, uh, we had one question. One person was asking. Uh, is cerebral edema is more uh, with the 0 0.1 unit per kg of insulin? Uh, I would request. It is uh, not conclusively uh, proven. Uh, the previous thinking is the higher the amount. I would request to please mute who are not using the mic right now. Dr. Mansi, please mute. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, Dr. Dr. Ravi, you are mute. Please unmute yourself. Yeah, am I audible now? Yeah, you are audible. Yeah, previous thinking is that higher amount of insulin, like 0 0.1, is associated with the cerebral edema. But now the current ISPAD guidelines say there is uh, the 0 0.1 is not been shown to be harmful. There is no higher risk of cerebral edema uh, in using 0 0.1 unit per kg uh, per hour by itself. But it depends on what the situation, what is the age of the child, what is the sensitivity, how much fluid we were given, and what is the presentation. That is why everything has to be taken into consideration. If the child demands it, you can give 0 0.1 unit per kg. So that's not a problem. Uh, there are a few more questions in the chat uh, on the question and answer session. So depending on the time, Dr. Richa, should we go about it or uh, we can take it later on? I think uh, I request Dr. Ravi if he can spare some time and uh, reply on the question and answer box. That will be very great. And uh, want to yeah, uh, okay, sure. I will go through it, but it says too fast, but I had to go through a lot of slides. Sorry about that. I had a lot of slides and I had to finish it. That's why. Uh, basically, there is one question on AKI with the associated with DK. So yeah. I think that is in the question and answer uh, chat box. Okay, yeah, I'll, 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 I'll answer that. Questions. Should I answer it separately? Yeah. Okay. So thank you so much. Thank you so much for the session, Dr. Ravi. Over to Dr. Richard. Okay. Uh, thanks a lot, Dr. Ravi, for a very wonderful discussion. 
uh, i know it's a very vast topic but definitely you have covered it so well uh, so i also thank dr shobhna dr manas for the chairing the session now let's uh, we let's move on to the another session it's a very important topic panel discussion on the day to day management of type 1 diabetes for the session we are very esteemed faculty uh, the session will be moderated by dr anurag vajpai he doesn't need any introduction he is a known teacher he is a very wonderful teacher uh, he is a pediatric endocrinologist from uh, kanpur he is a con uh, he he is trained from uh, australia and he is an editor of four, uh, four books for related to pediatric endocrinology and in many with many indexed uh, publications our panelists are dr krishna biswas she has been my mentor and guide dr ravindra she is a friend and a very active member of iap north delhi she uh, he is uh, at hindura hospital and looking after the pediatric endocrinology department and then we have dr ehsan he is a pediatric endocrinology faculty from turkey and he has kindly accepted our invitation to enlighten us on this uh, topic and dr ahilya uh, i hope everybody has listened to her on she was the first to start our sessions on the first day of the meeting and she is a pediatric endocrinologist from coimbatore and we have dr we have dr mansi also she is a dietitian from fortis hospital shalimar park now i request dr anurag to start the session um thanks a lot dr richa for this wonderful opportunity to interact with so many people from across the country and the world on this very important topic and uh, while uh, most of us really get stuck up with the dk management and that becomes a key issue the actual problem starts after dk because dk has got lost science into it there's a lot of protocols there but the actual diabetes management is more of the art of management and what we're going to do now is that to we'll discuss how we can use science and art together to achieve a good outcome in that perspective so uh, what we'll do over the next 40 minutes or so is to use just case if what you've done is that it will be entirely case based discussion and we'll try to bring out the various features with regards to the evaluation and management of pediatric diabetes in that perspective and you're focusing exclusively on type 1 diabetes because that's pretty much the most common form still in that perspective now type 1 diabetes as i said is a mixture of both science and art and we need to be really overall aware about the different situations and conditions and management of this is one typical case which i saw maybe when i came back in on a decade ago and this was very common at that time luckily things have improved but she was started on a premixed insulin 6 year old girl with type 1 diabetes 12 units in the morning 6 in the evening now what you have done is that we are using a completely unphysiological regimen in a girl who is we don't know when is going to eat how much is going to eat and of course sugars were everywhere and the worst part was that on top of it it was mentioned as brittle diabetes on the prescription so it's not brittle diabetes it's actually brittle treatment so we need to really understand that if we do correctly diabetes is not brittle it is that treatment which is brittle and we are trying to go through the different aspects of diabetes management right post dka towards the end and how things will progress from that perspective so we have the first situation a 10 year old boy who presents to a pediatrician with enuresis has been found to have a urinary sugar which is 2 plus random blood sugar is 320 and this child has been advised a oral glucose tolerance test Now this is not an unusual situation, Doctor Ahila. Do you agree with this line of management of this child who has two plus urine sugar and three twenty blood sugar to go ahead with the OGTT? Good afternoon, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here, and thanks uh, for the kind invite, and thanks, Doctor Ravindra Kumar and Anurag. Um, this is something we see repeatedly, and we've been trying to educate families. This the first slide I always use in my lectures on type one diabetes in India is. any child where you have a was random blood sugar of more than 200 that child goes into the hospital by the time you wait you have the child fasted and try to do an ogtt quite a few of these children slip into diabetic ketoacidosis and they land in the hospital in a very bad state the time is so precious and some of them have to travel hundreds of kilometers to reach a good center for appropriate treatment so the first point i always tell all general pediatricians is if you see one single random blood sugar of more than 
you repeat it once if you are doubtful immediately and then send the patient for treatment because you can prevent diabetic ketoacidosis and all the associated complications i've seen children land up with a ph of 6.8 6.7 ventilated and so sick just because you kept on i've seen ogtd being done thrice on three consecutive days if you have one random blood sugar as per the criteria suggested by the american diabetes association which i think anurag will project shortly the most important point is don't do an ogtd if you have suspicion of diabetes in the child take it as type 1 and start treatment uh, start investigation and treatment as soon as possible don't wait and allow the child to go into diabetic ketosis so as dr ahida said this child was back two days later and was landed up in severe dk now all of us are asked how can we prevent diabetes we cannot prevent type 1 diabetes but we can definitely prevent dk each episode of dk is preventable so the big message is as dr ahila was saying and these are the criteria from the ada which are pretty much the same adult criteria so if you have a random reading more than 200 with classical symptoms here you go this is clear clearly much clearly saying that this child actually has a dk so dr ahila are you able to uh, so i think what is very clear from this case is that uh, if you have a child who is symptomatic and most children will be symptomatic when they come to us their sugars are high you have to definitely start considering immediate evaluation excluding dk and don't wait for a ogtt that's a big message which comes out from this case now we have got this 6 year old boy with type 1 diabetes what would be the initial assessment so he has come to you uh, dr ehsan and uh, isan and what do you think would be the most appropriate way what things have to be looked into and how do we go forward from that perspective uh thank you dr anurag and uh, thank you all everybody who joined the meeting uh children with suspected diabetes mellitus should be evaluated as standard as in all other pediatric patients this approach includes description of presenting complaints medical history family history physical examination and later some laboratory tests will help us plan clinical approach month in the first stage some tests should be done to evaluate the presence of dka and level of the dehydration in patient these are blood count electrolytes blood urine nutrition ketone and blood gases uh in the second stage the presence of diabetes related autoimmune disease should be investigated these are hashimoto thyroiditis and celiac disease If available, diabetes-associated antibodies should also be checked. This will help determine the type of diabetes in patient. The presence of diabetes-associated antibodies confirms the diabetes diagnosis of type 1 diabetes, since one or usually more of these antibodies are present in over 90% of these children with type 1 diabetes. Uh, after that, uh, we should check uh, uh, their eye. to rule out the cataracts or refractive errors for baseline assessment uh, at this time uh, the microvascular complication is not possible if a child uh, the diabetes onset before 12 months or pubertal with not keto ketosis uh, we should consider the genetic test to rule out the monogenic diabetes Yeah, so I think that's a very, very nice slide, and it covers entirely the major parts. The most important investigation, of course, is the ketones, sugar, or DK, and often thyroid and celiac, which are very important, which everybody should basically be doing. It's very easily available. Our study has shown that celiac TTG may be positive until five years from diagnosis. So annually, also you have to follow it up both thyroid and celiac. Doctor, is in your comments regarding like these tests, like GAD antibodies, the ZNT8 are quite expensive. so if you have a classical case who comes to you with let's say type 1 diabetes lean individual early onset dk like would you like to do it in everybody or what would there be certain situations in which you have to do it others you can avoid it because this becomes a difficult for many families to afford in that situation yes i agree with you uh Uh, after uh, the initial step of diagnosis diabetes the differentiation between type 1 type 2 monogenic and other forms of diabetes has important implication for both therapeutic decisions and educational approach as you mentioned most of these patients are type 1 diabetes in pediatric age groups uh, can you forward the slides please yes and more and more and more okay 
Uh, as I mentioned before, uh, onset before one year old should be indicated a neonatal diabetes. If during the follow-up, low insulin need, antibody negative, strong family history will indicate monogenic diabetes. Initially, who diagnosed with type one, type two diabetes, uh, if children no obese, no obese, and no have acanthosis, we should consider the monogenic, monogenic diabetes or latent onset uh, autoimmune diabetes. Early sulfonylurea failure, ketosis will um, consider to latent autoimmune diabetes and abnormal fat distribution. And we will take into account lipodystrophic syndromes. Yeah, I think that's a very important message that although we do recommend that it would be better to have the antibody test done, but if you have a very classical presentation in a prepubertal child who presented to you with DK, maybe it's not essential. But the key message out here, as Dr. Eason very nicely pointed out, before six months, definitely genetic test. Six to 12 months, do the antibodies if they are negative to the genetic test. And type 2 is becoming more common after puberty, which is very common. But if you have everybody post-pubertal, non-DK, doesn't become type 2, you have to think of Modi and LADA particularly in that perspective. I think this two slides are very, very clear in terms of how do we evaluate an approach from that perspective. Now, other important issue is, it's as I said, it's not just science. So what are the art with regards to evaluation, Dr. He said, what are the other things we have to look at in that setting? Uh, before starting diabetes test education, it is necessary to learn the characteristic of the child lifestyle, parents' education level, socioeconomic status, time at schools, and etc. Uh, next slide, please. Yeah. Uh, we must raise awareness of the, what they should live with. The diabetes care team should emphasize that the family and child are the center members of the care of the team. And for this lifelong disease, it's very important for the patients and their families to have the right information and the right attitude at the beginning. We provide this with the diabetes education. According to the source of the clinics, some provides diabetes education fully in outpatient clinics if there is no decay. For example, in Tel Aviv, Israel, Schneider Hospital, they provide 24 seven accessibility and consultancy service by phone. Some provide diabetes education in, for 10 to 12 days fully in patient clinics, such as in Germany, Leipzig. In our clinic, we provide structured education of diabetes at least for five to seven days in our inpatient clinic. First day, we talk about diabetes, what is diabetes, what is pancreas, what is beta cells. Second day, we talk about insulins, monitoring blood glucose. Third day, we talk about hypoglycemia management, honeymoon phase. Fourth day, we talk about hyperglycemia, insulin sensitivity, sick day management. And five day, we talk about exercise and diet. If the child and family are able to do, to do it, we provide the car count training. In this case, instead of the fixed doses, the insulin dose is determined according to carp in the food she or he eats. We also inform families about diabetes technologies and encourage them to use diabetes technologies if they can afford it. I think that's a key that we have a very structured program. Resources should be available. Both now videos are very easily available. We can use a video tool. We can use our uh, remote connect application. A lot of things are there. So we have to educate in that perspective. And children is the center part as far as the evaluation is concerned. So now if you move forward, this child now, his weight is 24 kgs, A1C is 9.4. He is non-ketotic. What should be the further plan, particularly with regards to insulin? Because as we discussed, insulin should be started as soon as possible in that regard. So Dr. Krishna, what sort of doses would you like to suggest? Which sort of things would you like to go forward in terms of the management? So Dr. Krishna, what will be the insulin requirement for this child? He is a non-DK person who basically presented with just hyperglycemia and a HbA1c of 9.4. Uh, is Dr. Krishna there? Yeah, she was there. Let me see. She was there. Uh, so maybe once she joined back, we can have it to her inputs as well. So Dr. Ravindra, what do you think? What will be the insulin requirement at this stage? I see that this is just a six-year-old. Yeah, and... just, uh, just. Uh, I, I'm, I'm back to back there. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, I'm sorry. I, I, I just. Got... 
for it. I mean, I, I, am I audible? Yes, yes, you are audible. Yeah. Am I audible? Yeah. You are audible. Yeah, yeah. Please just show the previous slide, please. Yeah, this is uh, uh, the... Yeah, actually yeah. the insulin requirement, uh, insulin requirement of a child actually varies from uh, uh, the clinical staging and also the age of the uh, uh, child. You, during the prepubertal period, usually the requirement is not uh, around 0.7 to 1 unit per kg. It may be uh, out if uh, during the remission, uh, the partial remission phase, it may go uh, as low as to 0.5 unit IU per kg per day. However, the we decide on the correct dosing uh, depending on the clinical situation. Uh, what is the uh, and also the we have to consider two three things that there, there should not be any obvious hypoglycemic problem and there should not be uh, their child should have harmonious growth according to the weight and height of the of chart of that population so this is a, a child with six year old mm -hmm. uh, who with is having 24 kg and I um, yes so uh, just a minute yeah actually i missed the previous slide please yeah. can you just uh, yeah yeah okay. so so he's is now he's having around nine points so 24 uh, kg 24 kg so what we start that we can uh, start with this because of the age uh 24 kg is it's coming around 0. 0.6 to 0. 0.8 you uh, it, it requires basically according to the uh uh, according to the blood glucose level. So what we talk, think about the physiological insulin secretion, the physiological insulin uh, secretion, usually there is in the non-fat state, there is a basal, a low basal insulin secretion, which is around 0.2 to 0.5 unit, which might go up to, to, up to 0.8 international unit. But as you know, that with food, there is a, uh, the, as the blood glucose rises, there is insulin no, in a normal person. What happens in a normal person? What happens in a normal person as we take food? There is a there is a, a insulin secretion occurs with a, a, from the beta cells, which is secreted from the cell by exocytosis and diffuses into the islet capillary blood, and it goes to the portal and then to the systemic. And up to the up to after after the food, there is it goes up to uh, the peak up, occurs up to 45 minutes to one hour and it goes back and falls up to the basal level. But however, in case of in a type 1 diabetes patient, what happens this uh, because of the beta cell destruction, this uh, rise, this uh, does not occur. So we have to give uh, external insulin to cover this uh, the, uh, the rise of postprandial rises and uh, also the basal secretion we have to cover by basal insulin so I think and really one has to remember one has to remember one thing that we never uh, can uh, mimic i mean we just trials and everything we are trying to mimic the physiological insulin secretion but all those uh, uh, regular insulin the uh, the biosimilar Everything we just try to mimic the uh, the ultra short acting short acting. We are trying to mimic the uh, the physiological secretion so that the rise of blood glucose is covered by the uh, rise in the insulin externally given insulin. So I think this is a very important point which Dr. Krishna is making that we want to replicate the physiological secretion of a basal insulin and a bolus insulin, and that's what we will talk many times here. Having said that, as Dr. Krishna mentioned, the portal delivery is not possible. So we are giving in the subcutaneous tissue. From there, it goes to the blood, to the liver. So of course, you will never be able to replicate the situation. So what we really want is a delivery system which actually detects sugar, gives titrated insulin, and shuts down when required. But this is something of artificial pancreas. A lot of work going on, but there's no true artificial pancreas which has been developed till now. Dr. Subrata is going to talk about technology a bit later after that in that perspective. Dr. Ravind, now we've got a lot of options available with regards to insulin. It's like a cafeteria out there. Now, which insulin works, how and which do you think is the best for this child and for most children with diabetes? Well, as uh, we have already seen that now we are very clear that this patient is suffering from type 1 diabetes and insulin is required. So, 
we need insulin which should be uh, mimicking the and as we uh, as a physiological so various option are available is maybe a short acting so the rapid acting intermediately acting and long acting as you we can see the difference in all is that that their action start after a couple of minutes peak comes after a couple of hours and the duration of action is for some hours if we see the most commonly used previously was the regular insulin which has been depicted in the with the green one and still being used in the low socio economic countries such as india the uh, if we see the property of this regular insulin the effect comes in 30 minute after giving the insulin and peak comes after 2 to 4 hours and it stays in the body for 5 to 8 hours so it means we have to give it 30 minutes before the food because after that it takes 30 minutes to give its effect and it takes 2 to 4 hour peak now problem with the pediatric patient with this type of insulin is that many a times we have given the insulin it may not be possible that patient who is just 2 year old or 3 year old or 4 year old they may not be taking the food so for that better people have uh, tried to search insulin which can give the action very rapidly for that better we have the rapid acting the insulin in the form of lispro aspartoglycinogen these insulin that give its effect just 10 to 20 minutes so means you can give just before the feed okay if the patient is about to have feed you can give just before the feed and they give its effect in 1 to 3 hours the peak effect comes and this stays in the body for 3 to 5 hours apart from that now we have a ultra short acting uh, insulin now many a times may not be possible that patient even after taking the insulin even then he is not taking the feed so we can give this insulin even patient when they have taken the feed because its effect just comes within minutes you say 5 to 10 minutes peak comes in 1 to 3 hours and duration is 3 to 5 hours so these three type of insulin say ultra fast acting rapid acting and regular acting basically used as a bolus regime to cover the breakfast lunch and dinner then comes the intermediate acting acting insulin which is known as nph now the nph is basically for those resource constrained uh, countries for example india or a poor patient who cannot afford the multiple daily doses for example if we are using basal bolus regime at least four uh, injection is required however if they are a poor patient who say only two times they will be having the insulin so for that matter we have this intermediate active insulin which is known as nph it action comes after 2 to 4 hours after giving the insulin peak comes in 4 to 12 hours and this stays in body approximately for 12 hours so benefit of that type of insulin is that we can mix it with the regular insulin so we can mix regular with this nph and we can give before breakfast and before dinner if we are giving this nph before breakfast means it's this effect come after 2 to 4 hours when patient will be taking the lunch so this nph part will be covering the lunch part although it's not a uh, ideal situation but anyway a poor country a poor patient who is not able to afford multiple injection and then as in the previous slide we have seen that there is a low level of insulin which is almost always there in the body even in the fasting stage so that for that better we need a long acting insulin in the form of this tetrabar glargin and digulidec the action of these tetrabar and glargin or digulidec it comes approximately 1 to 2 hours after giving the injection peak they are these glargin and tetrabar almost peak like insulin and they stays in the body for 20 to 24 hours especially the tetrabar and glargin however digulidec stays in the body approximately for more than 40 hours so by by choosing out of these combination uh, by of uh, these insulin we can have one other rapid acting ultra rapid or regular insulin as a bolus uh, insulin before breakfast before lunch and before dinner and a long acting insulin either dectamer glargin or diglet to give a minimum dose or minimum concentration of insulin throughout the day
so that we we can mimic the normal physiological uh, response of the body to the food which otherwise happens in a normal patient so i think now it's very important that we need to go beyond the usual regular and npa there are a lot of other insulins available and although they seem to be more costly and expensive if we really look at in terms of the benefits of hypoglycemia and other things they may offset it so we need to use it as a tailor made basis and not think that one insulin fits everybody as dr ravinder so wonderfully explained on that now just a few quick tips dr ravind with regards to the storage of insulin because many of the pediatricians need to really explain to the patients so what yeah. are the key tips you will say about yeah. that insulin storage this is a very important uh, question because we have to explain to the patient that these are very temperature labile uh, medicines so they have to be kept up to 2 to 8 degree so that they should not lose their potency then again comes the question because many of our patients may be poor for example i am working in a government hospital we are i'm dealing with the lots of poor patients and you might be encountering these poor patient they don't have refrigerator at their home then there are various uh, indigenous method one of them has been shown earthen pot where we are we can have at least one uh, these earthen pot or someone they have devised even two earthen pot one a small one large you put in the large one sent below the at the bottom of that and smaller earthen pot in that larger earthen pot so that will give you the temperature of somewhere you can say 20 to 24 and you can keep insulin in that earthen pot however we should avoid freezing because repeated freezing and thawing the insulin will lose its causing uh, potency there should not be no direct sunlight so when we are uh, taking uh, insulin from market to home it should not be exposed you have put it into for your car no it should not be exposed to the sun ray and yes after using these uh, insulin because we are we are using syringes their appropriate disposal is the must and as far as if we look at the potency of these insulin so how low they stays next please next slide i think it's very very important the storage is very very important many times people freeze it and then the insulin is bad it's not going to work you have to dispose it that is a very big message which is to be there it may remain stable for up to around 28 days most people will say and earlier 30% and otherwise the effect may be lost on that Now, six-year-old boy post DK has discussed on pre-mixed insulin. Some sugar they're not getting control, and she has been referred uh, to Dr. Ahila. Now, Dr. Ahila, what sort of regimens do you have in mind? What would you like to put the child on in that perspective? And one popular regimen is, of course, split mix. So, how would you go forward on that, Dr. Ahila? Um, thanks, Anura, for that question. I have four hundred children with type one diabetes, and I think uh, only two or three of them are on pre-mixed, and they all. a patient who may inherited on premixed insulin i have never started premixed insulin in even one single child as dr ravindra kumar had mentioned i use nph and uh, regular insulin quite frequently and that gives me a good control in the sense i use nph and regular insulin in a syringe because the cost of the vial would only be about 137 140 rupees each and the whole cost of the month's therapy would be very easy to manage so what we do is um though we start off with the regime of two thirds in the morning one third in the evening and then two thirds long acting and one third short acting that is only for the start of the regime soon after dk most of these children are insulin resistant and instead even in pre pubertal children instead of 0.7 unit per kilogram per day they may go need as much as 1 unit per kilogram per day and as they start their treatment gradually their insulin sensitivity comes back and the doses start dropping after two weeks two reasons one is insulin resistance the second is the energy that they've lost over the previous month when they were undiagnosed they are trying to replenish their stores of uh, uh, the their nutritional stores so they tend to eat a lot and they need more doses so though we start as two third one third we gradually tailor it to the patient's blood sugar so i do blood sugars about six times when they are in the hospital pre breakfast pre lunch pre dinner which we always schedule at around 6 pm in the evening pre supper which is at about 9 pm and then 2 am if they are at home in the hospital we do at 12 am and 4 am just to see the trend of blood sugars and i have never used uh, pre mix so i'm not very sure on how to go about 30 70 in the morning and then 50 50 i just can't tailor at all rather than that i would prefer a nph regular in very poor patients so we take 
the there are a few points which are very very important in practical management if they start learning to take the regular insulin first in the syringe and then the nph i tell them all through their schedule they should always stick to taking the same insulin first because even the amount of insulin the needle can make a change to their type of blood sugar control that they achieve so they always take regular first and nph and i have a simple way of telling them for uneducated people this is called water injection when it is regular and milk injection is your long acting water acts fast milk works slowly the same way the regular insulin works fast and the milk like insulin works slowly and then i also add one regular insulin dose for lunch to tide over the carb there so we use uh, nph and regular in the morning and nph and regular for dinner and for lunch we use only regular and this is more important in uh, children who are just reach nearing their pubertal changes so i am more used to this and then for children who can afford or teenagers or children who are just past their teenage adolescent period we use uh, ultra short acting insulin because they can take it when they want and they have a basal insulin but for others uh, i always check the blood sugars pre lunch which always tells me whether the morning regular was fine the pre dinner will tell me if the lunch was uh, insulin was good and the carbs were matched for the insulin and the supper one would tell me if my dose at uh, dinner was fine uh, so this is how we tailor our doses and uh, our basal bolus regimen i use for two important groups one is under 5s and the other one is uh, the ones who are nearing puberty and i keep talking to these families about how the long term management depends on tight blood sugar control rather than uh, reducing the number of shots that they are taking i so think that's as, very, that the options both options work where and you have to tailor made it you can't just fit that everybody should have this everybody should have that you have a option which is available and basal bolus and split mix depending upon the situation will both of them work the principles are pretty much the same and what dr ahila was saying a lunch time dose being given as a regular insulin is pretty much like a basal bolus like we are trying to mimic the similar phenomena so the physiology already has been discussed in that regards so i think this is very important part that has been covered now very important questions which are coming in the mind of every parent who comes to us with our nutrition and we've got uh, very wonderful inputs from um, ms mansi regarding that they'll always ask whether he can have rice and potato whether he can have cake and pastry whether he can have sugar free products and can he fast so there are a huge number of questions which come up and some way people are fixated with diet now is there any diet particularly for type 1 diabetes children uh ms mansi do you think they need to just have a normal healthy diet what is your take on that so good afternoon everyone so thank you sir thank you for giving me the opportunity yes certainly a diabetic baby can have rice and potatoes as asked by the first question but yes we need to take care that it should be consumed in limited quantity quantity and insulin will be adjusted as per the dietary intake so however eating a small portion of starchy vegetables will be considered as a healthy full diet and moreover it is a complex carb that takes the body little longer to break down than simple sugars so replacing it with half of the amount the baby consumes and then taking over the more intake of lentils will significantly reduce the negative effect of uh, diabetes also it will lower down the gi uh, load of the diabetes so definitely a person can have rice and potatoes so as uh, asked by you the second question was yeah we we'll go to the question the big message which you are giving is that there is no specific diet for children they need to have a healthy diet which should be balanced flexible and allow children to grow in that perspective so what do you think will be the different component carbohydrates so you're asking about no carb diet and keto diet do you think they should go for that sir i i please can please when a lot of people talk about low carbohydrates no carbohydrate diet no 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 No, 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 sir. Certainly, there has to be a specific percentage. Like carbs has to be fifty to fifty-five percentage. Twenty to twenty-five percentage should be from fats, and there should be a liberal intake of uh, fiber. And so we need to calculate it accordingly. And there will be specifically a there is no as a fixed diet chart. But yes, we need to take care that whenever we are planning a diet for the baby, uh, insulin monitoring is certainly required. Monitoring will have to be done. Insulin will be adjusted. because we cannot deny the pleasures of the life with from the child 
so we need to take we need to take care of that part also earlier we you earlier we used to talk about that that there should be a minimum fat consumption to lower down the blood sugar levels but recently ada guidelines say that a person needs to be more vigilant because they also talk about that there will be a they lift restrictions on sucrose to table sugar and they allow a diet which is high in mono unsaturated fatty acids so we need to take care of that part also i think it's a overall balance which is very very important so right. now you can just answer rice potato you have said yes cake and pastry in a party yes or no yes yes certainly yes sir he can have but yes it will be in limited quantity monitoring will be done and insulin will be adjusted as per to the specific requirement and sugar free products how often do you encourage yes. them yes sir it's like sugar free products are available in the market sweets and ice creams everything is available in the market supermarket it is available sugar free it is available they should not consume it but because uh, there is a way that uh, if it is if if it, if someone do not consume it uh, also it has lot of carbs in it so uh, it can affect our blood sugar level so it should not be consumed ideally Uh, you can have some amount of sucrose anyway, which is there. And fasting again is something which you have to be very careful about in type one diabetes because of a lot of fluctuations which happens. Right, right, right. I think you really covered it very nicely. Now, uh, so the next question, of course, is how to monitor and adjust the sugar reading from that perspective. So we'll have your thoughts on how to monitor in that situation. How frequently? What sort of targets are we looking at? Role of HbA1c in that situation. uh thank you dr amira um the self monitoring uh, <coughs> self monitoring of glucose are um usual uh, monitoring of the child and when child uh, monitor his glucose levels he should aware his device which device he used the coat expiry time of the strips he always check he should check them um how much measurement are enough um um more measurement are better than less them uh for usually we uh, suggest the patients to measure their blood glucose pre and post meal and uh, there is a lot of time between uh, dinner and bedtime we suggest them uh, measure blood glucose also at the bedtime if there is unusual levels of the glucose like high or low levels we suggest them check the blood glucose at 2 am or 3 am at the night and after the exercise the exercise uh, the goal uh, the target range for strict uh, control in patients are like as child without diabetes but but in usually we uh, use target range a bit above yeah, this like pre meal range between 90 to 130 post meal from 100 to 180 and bedtime 100 to 180 if the blood levels is are above the this range this is a suboptimal control and we should check uh, the diet of the children and the uh, insulin doses based on his body weight uh yes thank you so on follow up after two years we see that this sort of a pattern is being there so we are seeing the sugar readings are going high and they are also going low in that particular perspective what do you think is going wrong here in our case that when we check the dairy of this child we can see the high blood glucose levels uh, usually in uh, before the breakfast um also the other levels are slightly high um the level of blood glucose before breakfast is a good uh, indicator of the uh, effects of the basal insulin insufficiency of the basal insulin will lead to the higher level of blood glucose during uh, before the breakfast uh so the possible the, the other possibilities are um smoggy effect and down phenomenon 
Uh, to discriminate these two phenomena, we should check the two, three a.m. blood glucose levels. In these patients, we can see it's also high. Um, result of this uh, assessment, we can say his uh, basal insulin can be insufficient, and we can increase this. Also, we uh, we will check the diet of the, these uh, children, especially uh, snacks before the going to bed is uh, can lead uh, these results. Um, I can say yes. So all of this. Definitely, in this case, we did notice that he was having a snack at bedtime, which is not required mm. for a basal bolus regimen, and that was mm. causing his sugars to go up. So I think that's a big point that you really picked up on clinical perspective. Mm. Now, as discussed, this we already discussed about self-monitoring and the targets which we have discussed in that perspective. The next issue, of course, is the goals of HPA1C, and uh, this I think is the most ideal goal, which is around seven percent. But it will also depend upon how your sugars are. So, if you have hypoglycemic unawareness, you have more hypoglycemia. The goals will be shifted towards the right side, and you have to also have to look yeah. at in terms of monitoring and other factors of that. And then finally, if it's more than eight and a half, nine, you have to think of some optimal control in that regards. Uh, we will now go ahead with another case, Dr. Ravi. That seven-day follow-up, you are seeing these sort of readings that all the sugars are pretty much all right, but the before-dinner sugar is very, very high. What is happening in this? Yeah, that's a very interesting scenario, and very often we used to see this scenario. Because if we look at the Dr. Mansi, can you mute yourself because lots of noise is coming from you. So if we see that. Then all the readings they are seems to all right. So I mean, it means our insulin regime is okay. Patient is following all the instruction, but just carefully looking only before dinner, all the uh, levels they are pretty high. So something wrong at this point. And the most commonly what happens these patients they have the evening snacks and they don't tell to their parents, and that is why before dinner sugars are very high. Otherwise. Insulin is working so well before breakfast. After breakfast, it's okay. After lunch, it's absolutely what is desired. But at bedtime, also it oh, seems to be fine. But before dinner, so it means something is going in the, as a form of evening snacks. So yeah. these evening snacks, they has to be checked appropriately. Uh, uh, so we gave insulin. A insulin just at the snack time, and that improved the control. So again, right. it's a very very really important clue to find with Dr. Ravi the digestive problem. Dr. Krishna, after three months of follow-up from diagnosis, all the sugar readings are low. What do you think is happening here, and what, how should we manage in the situation, Dr. Krishna? Yeah, this is a situation actually uh, very commonly seen, and parents get very happy that they think that okay, the diabetes is cured. This is basically called a honeymoon phase, where there is some partial recovery of the beta cell function. And uh, how we recognize that that where there is a ease of control, patient develop hypoglycemia, and the sugars are almost all controlled. It can be confirmed also by the checking the C peptide. It can occur up to within weeks, up to months. It and it may be up to three months. So in that case, uh, as a requirement falls dramatically, even up to less than 0.3 unit per kg. But they and it may be so. Some people may not require uh, 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 insulin also. Even, however, we have to convince them. The parents, this is a situation we have to convince because at times they just disappear and tell that okay, I am fine. The child is fine, and after a month or so, they land up with diabetic ketoacidosis in any emergency of any hospital. So in this situation. Insulin dose should not be stopped abruptly, according to the moni blood glucose monitoring chart. Some dose should be given. The, the the major concept is that this is not a curable condition. This is a lifelong disease. And another thing is, if there is interruption of the treat of the uh, insulin uh, injection, intermittent insulin injection might at at Times leads to lead to insulin allergy, and lead to angioneurotic edema and sort of urticaria. So, patients basically the parents has to has to be convinced, and at the very first go, 
when they are willing to learn willing to listen they should be told to them that this sort of thing happens this occurs don't think that your condition that your child is cured over to the very nicely put by dr krishna don't stop insulin dr ahin after one year we are seeing fluctuating sugars all across the day some high some low so what's happening why is the sugar sometimes low at the same time same time high what would you like to look at on examination dr ahin uh, we made it as if it's a very difficult question and uh, if you put up the picture i think everybody in the audience will pick up the answer yeah so this is something which all of us keep seeing and people are so fascinated or the children are so comfortable with one area of the uh, whatever area they used to usually it's just on either side of the umbilicus the children are very comfortable and once they get used with they want that injections only there and then you get collection and have lipohypertrophy so the absorption is erratic the action is erratic you can't predict the reaction you will get for the carb count and the amount of insulin you have given so this is a typical lipohypertrophy and the management would be to rest this place for 3 to 6 months and shift to another area so we have a common way of teaching in our uh, in our hospital during the initial diabetes education so we ask them to use one half of the abdomen for one week the second uh, the other side of the abdomen for the second week a uh, gluteal region one side for third week the other gluteal region for the fourth week one thigh for the fifth week and another thigh for the sixth week and we always tell them to go one pen apart for each shot so that they learn to do it and it is always rotated i'm not a big fan of arms in younger children though in older children we do use arms and i also tell them there may be a variable action depending on the site of injection abdomen may be very sensitive the gluteal region may you may need a little bit more but once you know your pattern it is good to change so you need to just shift your areas around and prevent lipohypertrophy to get a good action so if you have such a variable always look at lumps before you do anything else we'll quickly find up because there are just couple of cases more i think dr eason this child now after another two years of follow up has all readings low he has already had one honeymoon phase is he allowed to have another honeymoon phase what is happening here uh Beyond the two years, uh, honeymoon is not possible. Uh, the majority of children with type one diabetes experience mild and um, sometimes moderate hypoglycemic events, but usually these are um, isolated events. When hypoglycemia is recurrent or insulin need is very low beyond the two years of after diagnosis, it is important to exclude a coexisting autoimmune disorders such as Addison disease, celiac disease, and sometimes thyroid disease. The comorbidities of celiac disease presence in 4 to 10 percent of children with type 1 diabetes, and Addison disease presence much less commonly. May also increase the risk of the hypoglycemia. The introductions of the gluten-free diet and appropriate treatment of Addison disease may reduce the frequency of the hypoglycemia. Autoimmune thyroiditis is more uh, less common than celiac disease and Addison disease. Uh, more, more common than celiac disease and Addison disease, but overt hypo, hypothyroidism is very, very rare. In summary, if an unexplained hypoglycemia is frequent, evaluation of unrecognized celiac disease and Addison disease should be considered. So I think we need to work up, and he turned out to have adrenal insufficiency, which is rare, but something which we need to really pick up in this sort of situation if there is a hypoglycemia subsequent. So, Dr. Ravindra, now after two years, you are seeing these readings, which are pretty much across the board in particularly very high reading he is already now around 14 years of age what do you think is happening here why is the fasting reading so high most probably the as you said that he is turning to the pubertal status so then his demand for insulin is going up because now his age is somewhere you, what is the age you said 12 well, years 14 years, years 14 years now so he is already so, into puberty so he is going into puberty and at the puberty yes now we, we, we the, the need for insulin there is very high apart from that if we look at the i mean all the issue that the before breakfast is yeah. going much higher and what we have taken at 2 am reading it is again higher 190 so the key the same either it is dawn phenomena or some other phenomena that we have to differentiate what is happening because it is happening as there is a hyperglycemia at 2 am also so means he is taking again the same thing something he is taking at probably that time maybe because of that of course that 4 am hormones are kicking up and they are creating yeah. yeah. some 
I think you have to be cautious on that. Now, just the last case, febrile illness, suddenly abdominal pain, vomiting, somebody does. It's a very common phenomena. Blood sugar 290, the parents call, shall we stop the insulin? So, Dr. Ravin, in maybe just three lines, you can just summarize what should be done for this child who is now with febrile illness and diabetes. Uh, so, so this is the most important because a case of type 1 diabetes, if he has, if he's having vomiting, it means it's a severe insulin deficiency until unless proved otherwise, until unless it is not acute gastroenteritis. So we have to be very careful. We have to uh, teach all these patients and their parents, seek the guidelines, seek the guidelines whenever they are having fever or abdominal pain or vomiting or per se any other illness. They do not have to stop the insulin. That the message should be very, very clear. Rather, they need the uh, these uh, sugar insulin level to go relatively high. Maybe have to increase by ten percent. There's only one situation: gastroenteritis, where we because of the uh, low calorie uh, patient is taking that we have we need to decrease the, the serum insulin intake. Apart from that, we have to monitor. The glucose, otherwise, these patients are very much prone to land up in DKA, as we have just uh, discussed in the previous lecture. The blood sugar has to be monitored at least four hourly, and ideally, somewhere two to four hourly. It should be somewhere between 100 to 180. If possible, we can have serum ketones. I mean, now we have a very POC meter point of care meters which can easily detect serum ketone in the same way as we are doing the blood sugar estimation. In a normal uh, patient of type 1 diabetes, it has to be less than 0.6 millimol because if it, these ketones are going more than that, then probably even if we are doing the urine ketones, they will come one positive if it is more than that. So if the ketones are going more than that, it means some sort of ketosis is going under the body and we have to be very careful, otherwise this patient is an impending DK may end up in DK. We have to see the hydration status also. We have to advise him to increase the food intake. Sugar in drinks only if the sugar is less than 100. However, if sugar is more than 180 or 200 or 250, then probably we need to have more of insulin. We have to control fever, give anti-emetic vomiting. Hydration, very, very important. We have to hydrate these patients. And total daily lows, as we have said, if we have increased by 10%, it means a cumulative sum of long acting and short acting if patient is on basal bonus. So I think never stop insulin is the key message and increase accordingly. So I think everybody has really covered a lot of vast topic. You have short over time by a minute, five minutes or 10 minutes or so. But the key messages are there is no role of oral glucose tolerance test in somebody with type 1 diabetes. Think DKA diagnosis. Uh, no role of premixed insulin. Basal bolus or split mix done properly would be good. There is no diabetic diet in terms of diabetes. Education is the mainstay. Close monitoring of blood sugars, minimum four readings a day, of course, adjusted as far as the economic status is concerned, and insulin is the key. That's what the key message of the entire panel has been. And I'd like to thank all of you and Dr. Richa and the entire organizing team of uh, eEndocon for uh, uh, allowing us to discuss about this important topic. And uh, over to you, Dr. Richa. Thanks a lot. Uh, thank you, Dr. Nurag, Dr. Krishna, Dr. Isan, Dr. Ravindra, and Dr. Ahilya for a wonderful discussion. I know it's a very, very vast topic and there will be multiple questions, but uh, it's good. I can see all the panelists have answered the question in the question and answer panel. Uh, just uh, we can take one question, which I think that what would be the good insulin regimen for a child who is, who is on three hourly NG feeds? This was one question. Uh, Sir, if you want to take this. Uh, that's, a, that's a very, very challenging situation. And uh, that could also depend upon what are the underlying condition and what sort of feeds are there. Because if we talk about a long-acting insulin, that will basically be a smallish dose of long-acting insulin to cover the basal requirement. And then we can use the ultra-short-acting. Sometimes we use the alternate feeds depending upon the frequency because giving it every three hours becomes very, very difficult. So our hospital usually will have uh, uh, intake of uh, ultra short uh, long acting insulin and then along with that alternate feeds we tend to give that if it is becoming too challenging and depending upon if it's a short term phenomena in that case we have also used infusion that gives a better uh, criteria to provide that so you can use a uh, uh, IV infusion as well so these are the two options available that's 
thanks a lot sir thank you thank you to all the panelists uh, i think uh, i will uh, though panelists are already responding on the i will request if there are any questions to the delegates also please put up in the question and answer and we can reply uh, in the answers so let's move on to the thank you let's move on now uh, moving on we have uh, learned a lot from time we diagnosed the diabetes and uh, now management has improved now we have technology to assist us so to discuss all these interesting new advances we have a have with us dr day for the session uh, i invite dr our coordinator dr hema to invite the chairpersons for the next session dr hema unmute karo pehle apne aap ko dr hema un good afternoon everybody so after an interesting discussion on diabetes we move further to advances and for this session i invite the chairpersons we have dr pavan mehta with us can we have the chairperson slides we have dr pavan mehta with us who is a consultant pediatrician at a director jaipur children hospital at fatehabad hisar haryana welcome sir the second chairperson the second chairperson is my colleague who is there at ramaro loya hospital dr vk gupta who is a consultant pediatrician and a senior consultant uh, an assistant professor and is in charge of pediatric endocrinology at ramaro loya and atal bihari vajpayee institute of medical sciences he has a huge follow up clinic of pediatric endocrinology i welcome him so now over to the chairpersons for the next session Uh, am I audible? Yes, you are. Uh, a very good afternoon to all of you. And uh, first of all, let me thank the organizers for giving me an opportunity to be a part of this academic session. We had a wonderful workshop from the morning. We had workshop on continuous glucose monitoring, and we had sessions on management of diabetic ketoacidosis. And uh, Dr. Nurag Bajpayee just uh, concluded a very well organized ambulatory management of type one diabetes. Now we move on to the recent advances in diabetes management. And for this, I invite Dr. Subhita Day, and he needs no introduction. He is a was the organizing chairperson of the recently concluded biennial meeting of the ISP at Kolkata last year. He is. Uh, HOD academics at Apollo Institute of Postgraduate Pediatrics and senior consultant pediatric endocrinologist at Apollo Green Eagles Hospital, Calcutta. His areas of interest is uh, uh, pediatric endocrinology. He has been a principal investigator in various global multicentric trials in type one and type two diabetes mellitus. He has been a thesis guide for over ten years, and he has a vast experience. and he is a pioneer pediatric endocrinologist of entire eastern india so now i invite dr subhita day sir to deliver his talk on newer advances in diabetes management sir so. at the outset i must thank dr ravindra for conceptualizing this mini ispecon and i think he and his team have done a wonderful wonderful job for the last 3 days covering a variety of topics and i think your entire team and special mention dr richa arora who has uh, interacted and has made sure everything is glitch free so thank you for giving me this opportunity and privilege to speak on new advances in the management of diabetes the are my slides visible yes sir yes sir you are visible so what's new novel medications novel genetic testing and diagnostic tools 
next generation sequencing for monogenic diabetes, third generation basal insulin analogs, Glargine 300, Degludec, ultra rapid insulin analogs, like fast acting Aspart, and this URLI is in the research stage, ultra rapid Lyspro, adjunct therapies with SGLT2 inhibitors in type 1 diabetes, novel medications for type 2 diabetes with SGLT2 inhibitors and GLP-1 uh, receptor agonists. Novel technology pumps, CGM, automated delivery system, hybrid closed loops, and the care link by which the patient can be advised by the physician remotely, novel clinical targets, HbA1c, and time and target range. So type 1 diabetes, I'm going to start that the modern era of diabetes management started 100 years ago with these two doctors from Canada, Banting and Best, when they injected it in a crushed pancreatic beta cells into their dog who was diabetic and the dog did well, called Marjorie. In this, and in fact, Dr. Banting's birthday is commemorated as the World Diabetes Day, which is 14th November which also incidentally is Indian Children's Day. Now, why talk about type 1 diabetes? It's because it's on the rise. 2017 statistics, we had over 1.3 lakh diabetics, and I'm sure in these three years, it has increased further. We are only second to US in the largest number of type 1 cases in the world. So the journey started in 1921, but and over those, you know, eight, 60, 70 years, it limped along. But then in 1993, there was a huge, huge uh, uh, breaking news type of study, the DCCT, which was published in 1993 in the NEJM, which basically showed that A1C is the gold standard for understanding the prevention of diabetic complications. And the diabetic complications were reduced significantly when the HbA1c was reduced from nine to 7%. Now, as you all know, and this has been covered probably in extensive length in today's workshop, there are three core glucose technologies, the finger stick with the glucometer, the A1C, which measures every three months, uh, average blood glucose and the CGM. Now, does A1C tell the whole story? So you have the upper panel where it's all very, very high volatile sugars and yet with A1C of seven, and then the, this panel where the sugars are all nice and banded together, and there you get an A1C of seven. So A1C does not track glycemic excursions, and 60% of glucose low may not be revealed by SMBG alone. CGM identifies four times more serious glucose excursion than SMBG. And this is an interesting cartoon. If I stand in a with one foot in a bucket of ice water and one foot in the bucket of boiling water, on average, I'm comfortable. So we'll know that this is not true. So CGM is actually shows the entire movie delivering information in between finger sticks. And if you see this, if you were to just offhand look at these numbers, these numbers on finger stick look pretty okay. But then what is happening between the numbers is not visible. So this would have been shown in today's, this is the Libre Pro uh, sensor, which is there for 14 days. It gives tracings like this. And what is interesting is it shows time in target range below and above. And this is very important to understand because time in range is now the new metric. So you have to keep it between 70 and 180. Below 70 is level one hypoglycemia. Below 54 is level two. And severe hypoglycemia is when the patient is highly symptomatic. Similarly, the level one hyper is more than 180 and level two is more than 250. And the next step is DKA. So there is a lot of differences between A1C and the TIR, the time in range outcomes. Because A1C levels basically compare uh, with one A1C, you're looking at an average of three months. Whereas the TIR evaluation, which could be achieved by multiple finger sticks or with at least eight per day or 
more conveniently the CGM. A1C does not capture hypoglycemia or hyperglycemia and it is less likely to capture impact of acute interventions and not the most important parameter for diabetic patients. It does not improve patients' mood and quality of life but does reduce the risk of macrovascular disease. So what is the relationship between TIR and A1C in type 1 diabetes? A1C of 7 actually correlates with 70% of blood sugar in the range of 70 to 180. And that is the equation. Now, moving on to another very important development in the last few years has been this awareness when we were growing up as trainees in pediatric endocrinology when i trained in cincinnati and we had to take care of over a thousand diabetics as the fellows there we were mortally scared of you know hypoglycemia because we were worried that they would have irreparable damage to their brain but you know, recent publications have shown that there were no significant differences in white matter structure between children with type 1 diabetes who experienced episodes of severe hypoglycemia seizures and those who did not. What is very interesting, in the last couple of years, there's a body of literature, and I've just taken one representative paper, just in the interest of time, and it showed that the axial diffusivity was lower in children with diabetes at, and baseline. Lower exposure to hyperglycemia was associated with higher fractional anisotropy, which is a proxy measure for myelination. Basically, this is assessed by special MRI scans of the brain. And fractional anisotropy was positively correlated with performance and full-scale IQ. The conclusion was that hyperglycemia is associated with altered white matter development, and this particularly happens in the young developing brain, and hence younger children who we are worried mainly about hypoglycemia, we should be equally worried about hyperglycemia. So any hyperglycemia may cause cognitive impairment, and this is going to be a major stellar message from today's talk. Now the ISPAD, basically the 2018 uh, you know, their, their clinical practice guidelines said the goal is now to keep for all children, adolescent and young adults, A1C of below 7. You can go up to 7.5. It may be appropriate in the following context. Inability to articulate symptoms of hypoglycemia, hypoglycemia unawareness or history of severe hypoglycemia, and lack of access to adequate self-monitoring supplies. The ISPAD goal pre-meal is 70 to 130, post-meal is 90 to 180, and pre-bedtime is 80 to 140. Now let's turn the page to the newer insulins. All of us are familiar with, you know, Aspart, Novorapid, Lyspro, Humalog, Glulicine, and now there is another player on the kid on the block which is the faster acting ASPART or FIASP, which has now recently been approved by the DCGI, although it had gained uh, FDA approval several years ago. And in long acting insulin, we have the insulin Degludec, which has been uh, recently been, uh, has been approved even for use in children above one year of age. And this is a comparison of the different insulins, Degludec, Duration of action is more than 42 hours, approved for one year and beyond. And most of the, and, and Glargine U300 is another new insulin, which has an onset of action two to six hours, and there's a minimal peak. And Degludec has a very minimal peak, and the duration of action is 30 to 36 hours, but the approval is for older children. So insulin Degludec has many advantages long duration of action, lower variability. This is a very important uh, aspect, reduced risk of hypoglycemia. And another very important thing is over time, when you switch somebody from Glargine, initially it is one is to one, but after some time, one finds that you may require only 75% of the dose of Glargine in the long run. The ultra short acting insulin 
is FIASP, which is the new kid on the block. Its onset of action is within six to 12 minutes. It is the closest to a physiological uh, peak of insulin. Peak is one to three hours, duration three to five hours, approved beyond one year of age. So FIASP is approaching a physiologic insulin where you look at this panel, this is from a normal response, a non-diabetic, and this is the closest among all the insulins to, uh, and then just to go back to the previous slide, even as part Lyspro, they have an onset of action of 10 to 20 minutes. So you should actually wait for 10 minutes to 15 minutes. And as you know, in regular, you have to wait for 30 minutes before giving them the meal. So these are all some of the most, you know, exciting new developments and the onset seven trial where they looked at FIASP at mealtime. They looked at post meal FIASP and mealtime normal aspart insulin. And they had large cohort. And what they showed is that mealtime faster aspart provided superior HbA1c control compared with the normal aspart. And post meal faster aspart was non-inferior to mealtime aspart. So it's a big advantage in younger children you can actually let them eat and then you can give the insulin. The action is as close to, I mean, the effectivity is as close to uh, giving a spot before the meal. So this was a study which showed in a type one diabetic where SGL2 inhibitor was used. And this was the DEPIC one and two studies. And they found that time in range 70 to 180 was 54% in patients who took dapaglifosin and for the ones with placebo is only 43 percent so basically 2.5 hours extra they were time in range alternate insulin route a lot of excitement with exubra it went out of the market in 2007 a freezer has been approved in the u.s cipla was trying to market the freezer in our country but so far this is not available it is a rapid acting inhaled insulin. Let's look at the diabetes technologies. I'm sure it has been covered in great detail in the, uh, in the workshop, but the important thing is this is the timeline that PG meters in 77, glucose sensors in 99, insulin pump therapy incidentally started in 1978, but the pump that time looked like a suitcase. So CGMS, is not only a novel, it's the only way to go. And this is the sensor, and this is the insulin pump. And these are various forms of pumps. And CSI is the most physiologic method of insulin delivery currently, and everybody agrees. And these were some of, these are the kids during my annual World Diabetes Day, you know, ages. Now these two kids, at that time they were eight years old, were my first pumpers. and they are almost like sisters they kept in touch and that was about seven years ago both are now 15 years of age so this is the gradation of the simple insulin pump to the you know to the smart pump and then we have the high closed hybrid and then we have the closed system which is very much now currently in research and may be available next year so this is my sweet little diabetic showing off her 640G, which is a predictive low glucose suspend. And this is the Minimed hybrid closed loop, which is not available in India, only in the United States, and where you can give basal insulin deliveries automatically adjusted every five minutes throughout to a target. And CARP, and this is the artificial pancreas where this computer chip basically is the control algorithm. And if this is successful, the pump will be autonomous and it will give basal and bolus if you feed in the appropriate data. So the SPAD recommendation where the predictive low glucose suspense system can prevent episodes of hypoglycemia and have been shown to reduce hypoglycemia exposure. Automated insulin delivery systems improve DIR, including minimizing hypoglycemia and hypoglycemia. And this was evidence A. So continuous insulin infusion or pump therapy can be used safely and effectively 
in youth with type 1 diabetes to achieve certain targeted glycemic control, reduces risk of hypoglycemia, reduces chronic complications, and it is appropriate regardless of age. And it can be, CGM can be used effectively for lowering HbA1c's, reducing glucose variability, and increasing time in range, which is 70 to 180, 70% of the time. However, this is India. Pumps are not cheap. CGM is not cheap. And oftentimes, affordability is a big issue. So sometimes we still have to make do with all this assortment of gadgets to keep our patients on course. So now let's move on to type 2 diabetes in the young. There have been a lot of new uh, thoughts. And uh, the practice guideline says that type 2 DM in youth should be diagnosed using the American Diabetes Association criteria which is fasting more than 126, PP uh, more than 200, and HbA1c 6.5 and above. In the absence of symptoms, testing should be confirmed with a repeat test on a different day. Diabetes autoantibody testing should be considered in all pediatric patients with a clinical diagnosis of diabetes because the risk of high, there is because a high frequency of islet cell autoimmunity in otherwise typical T2DM. So this is the message that when you have a patient who looks, you know, type 2 very clearly, family history, etc., you must do a C-peptide fasting and you must send the antibodies. Subsequent treatment, you must, their goal, A1C is less than 7%. Within four months of metformin therapy, if they haven't reached, basal insulin should be strongly considered. This is a major message. If target is not attained on the combination of metformin and basal insulin, up to 1.5 unit per kilo, prandial insulin should be initiated and titrated to reach target A1C less than 7%. Other pharmacologic agents are generally not approved for use in this population. Initial treatment is lifestyle changes to be recommended at the time of diagnosis. Uh, T2DM, initial pharmacologic management of youth with T2DM should include metformin and insulin alone or in combination, depending on degree of hypoglycemia and metabolic disturbances and presence or absence of ketosis or ketoacidosis. The goal of treatment should be A1C less than 7.0. Self-monitoring, SMBG or self-monitored blood glucose should be performed regularly. Subsequent treatment, uh, the use of sulfonylurea agents is not recommended due to increased risk for hypoglycemia and more rapid loss of beta cell function. This is a very important no-no. GLP-1 receptor agonist is now going to be a major player major RCT was published, which I'll talk about in a minute. SGL2 inhibitors, a lot of RCTs are going on and likely to be safe and efficient. TPP4 inhibitors are also being considered and glitazone or combinations also with insulin or all the modalities which we are trying to interpolate from the adult literature. So this was the study which was published in NEGM in 2019 talked about liraglutide in children and adolescents with type 2 diabetes, and it showed convincingly that it lowered A1C, fasting plasma glucose, and reduced the BMI. So this is was a landmark study, and very soon we'll be approving this. In, in fact, I'm also part of a multi-centric study in which we are studying uh, dulaglutide. So this will be the next major thing, especially in obese type 2 diabetes. So monogenic diabetes and recommendation of ISPAD that it is uncommon, 1 to 6% of pediatric diabetes. All diagnosed with diabetes in the first six months of life should have immediately molecular genetic testing with next generation sequencing. Presented, presentation between 6 and 12 months of age, testing for not for uh, for uh, monogenic diabetes should be limited to those without islet cell antibodies as the majority of patients in this group have type 1 diabetes so this is a summary of modi and remember 
there should be three generations involved they should not be obese and it is important to see if they have presented at a young age and these are the different common modis and this hnf 1a uh, mutation shows progressive beta cell dysfunction and glycosuria low dose sulfonylurea can treat they do not need insulin can discontinue that and so is the case with hnf 4a mutation and this is usually associated with fetal macrosomia and neonatal hypoglycemia and this is the important uh, entity the modi2 where there is stable uh, beta cell function you will see slightly mildly raised blood sugars but no treatment is required and modi5 they require insulin because they have exocrine pancreas insufficiency as well as beta cell destruction or developmental defect not destruction so i end here with these take home messages cgms is now a globally recommended tool hba1c has its pitfalls tir the new paradigm in t1 dm management 70% of cbs should be 70 to 180 hba1c goal is 7% time out of range especially hyper glycemia is associated with neurocognitive impairment hyperglycemia causes worse white matter damage and cognitive impairment so beware of hyperglycemia in young children type 2 diabetes in young antibody testing should be done so that you don't miss out an obese type 1 diabetic presenting like a type 2 metformin and plus minus basal insulin is still gold standard although gl glp1 uh receptor agonists and sgl2 are likely to be approved soon for the age 10 to 18 diabetes mellitus with onset before 6 months needs next generation sequencing for diagnosis and this is the picture of last year's world diabetes day all the children look happy because they just had lunch and we were happy because we could have them on board and mind you this was just two weeks before the ispe so i was very happy we could hold the meeting so with these few words i thank you for your patient listening i hope i've kept to the timeline and uh, i'll be happy to take any questions thank you uh, thank you very much sir uh, i think uh, we can take the question in the question and answer box because uh, we are already late almost 15 minutes we are running late and we, you can type the answers there also only no for the next session i invite uh, uh, it will be on the frequently asked question about the diabetes and it will be taken none other than the organizing secretary herself dr richa aroda so i invite dr richa uh, to proceed for the next session thank you dr thank you thanks thank you all so i think uh, as i've been listening since the afternoon the sessions my this is basically a summary and all the questions uh, of, of that we encounter whenever we see a patient of type 1 diabetes we have lots of the patients have lots of questions to ask whenever they are so let's go through them and uh, you when you go through the, when you listen to it you will real uh, will feel that you have answered or encountered these questions quite commonly so there are questions uh, for the patient by the um, for the by the patients like time, questions at the time of diagnosis questions ongoing during the treatment so at the time of diagnosis first uh, parents really want to know is it confirmed are you sure nobody in the family has diabetes how did the child has it uh, do you want to do any test to confirm the diabetes uh, i have encountered this question quite number of times shall we get a ct ultrasound to see the pancreas any other test to confirm the type 1 diabetes so so answer to this question is uh, it has been discussed in panel also so it is an antibody test auto antibody test that can be done uh, usually we do a gad 65 igg antibody antibody for the glutamic acid decarboxylase uh, 
islet cell antibodies ICA against the cytoplasmic protein in the beta cell or insulin antibodies to protein tyrosine phosphatase. But they come, they are not 100% specific. GAD is seen in 65 to 80% of the patients at clinical presentation. ICA is in 69 to 90% of the patients. IA 2A1 in 54 to 75% of the patients and IAA in 70% of the patients. So now the question is, what are the early warning signs? So I think this is a learned audience. So it's a frequent urination, polydipsia, dry mouth, itchy skin, increased hunger, unexpected weight loss, slow healing wounds, and fungal infections. In fact, I had seen one 16-year-old girl who had present with mucormycosis. She lost an eye also that was at presentation. So next question by the parents is, does the child need lifelong insulin? The answer is yes. Without insulin, the person living with diabetes cannot survive. There is no role of oral medications in type 1 diabetes. As Dr. Nurag was uh, also compiled it, it's insulin, insulin, insulin. There is, uh, in simple words to say to the patient is, it's the absence of insulin in the body. We need to replace the insulin that the body is not making. And it is achieved either by injections or pump. Now the next, uh, we have seen, uh, as we discussed also, that there's a honeymoon phase. So in the, uh, it's better to uh, tell, tell the parents in the beginning about the honeymoon phase. There's a honeymoon phase when the requirements of insulin decreases, the pancreas is able to produce additional insulin. It lasts for weeks to months. Parents mistake this phase with cure. Though it is not the case, diagnosis always remains. And uh, as Dr. Krishna, the parents go, they feel they have been cured but they again land up two months after with diabetic ketoacidosis. Having said that, studies have been done to try drugs to prolong the honeymoon phase. Many patients, people are dedicated to this area of research and the searching for the cure. Now, the next question is, can my child be a normal child? Can he play? Can he go to the school? Can he lead a normal life? There are enough examples to prove that the diabetic people can live an absolutely normal life, except that they have to keep the blood sugar records, which they have to change the diet with exercise and do changes in diet and activity accordingly. So these are the few examples like Sonam Kapoor. We have, you can see she has grown up. She a, has a career. Then Imran Khan is a cricketer. Then we have uh, Nick Jones. Then we have Kamal Hassan. These examples, when we give these examples to the patients, they also feel very confident that they can live an absolutely normal life. After the initial, uh, initial acceptance of the disease, there comes a blame. Why my child? What wrong we could have done? Something wrong in the diet, something wrong in the mother's diet. The answer to all this question is no. No one is to be blamed. It's an autoimmune disease, still reasons not known what triggers the autoimmune process. Nobody is to be blamed, neither the child nor the parents. Next comes the fear. Can my other child also have the same illness? What are the chances? What tests should I get done? What precautions I can take? The answer uh, is yes, your child can get an illness and the chances are more than the normal children. We can get an antibody testing to see the chances. But unfortunately, at the moment, we don't have any treatment modalities to slow the progression or prevent the disease from occurring, even if we know he has at the risk. Then comes the period of hope. Is it permanent? Can't it be reversible? I think uh, it's a very important point to be emphasized in the first visit also that it is permanent. Uh, then they say, can we take an Ayurvedic treatment? There's enough data to prove it's not of much use. Uh, you should not stop insulin. Don't stop checking the blood sugars. Otherwise, child will have diabetic ketoacidosis. Uh, another important aspect is diet. There are uh, lots of um, myths. <coughs> this diet can be taken. That diet can be taken. Lots of myths have been uh, taken, uh, taken up in the panel also. So there are certain uh, queries like, shall we tell him to follow a strict diet? Shall we prepare food separately for this child? Can he go to any party? So the main take home message is healthy balanced diet is the key. He should be taking almost the same food as the family takes. Healthy lifestyle is the key. Child needs adequate nutrition for the growth and development. 
uh, will it spread through him or any other person no it is not a communicable disease actually this slide i put because i my one of the diabetic educator went to a patient and when he visited the home he realized that the child was eating separately from the family because they felt that it was a communicable disease so i think this is a very important message that we have to there are wrong notions about the disease also so once uh, these were the questions that we were dealing with before the diagnosis now once the diagnosis have been made now the questions changes they have the acceptance have become okay now it is now they want to ask do i can, shall i give twice daily premixed regimen the answer is no it is not physiological we have uh, attended the session since morning and there is enough evidence to show that there is a poor control there are more chances of hypoglycemia there are more chances of complications in future because of the poor glycemic control so what is the best insulin regimen basal bolus or premixed twice daily basal bolus is the best insulin regimen as in fact pump is the best but obviously it's not always feasible so basal bolus is the best as we can see in these two uh, the basal bolus is physiological we have a baseline insulin and we have the insulin that, uh, that insulin that is given before every with every meal and then but this is a premixed we have in uh, in advent periods of hypo and hyper which cannot be taken care of now is the sugar testing why so many times how many times what are the methods yes sugar testing is very important in this i will say knowledge is power when we know we have what are the blood sugar conditions of the baby then we can monitor the child appropriately minimum we need 4 to 5 readings per day so continuous glucose monitoring is really beneficial having the knowledge of blood sugar is really helpful making the lifestyle predictable uh, flexible and also for the better control and and to prevent long term complications so cgm is the way ahead now <clears throat> there are certain myths will my child become dependent uh, a, a simple answer is that there is absence of hormone in the body that needs to be replaced so there is no dependency any side effects of taking insulin for a long time no so the basic emphasis is that insulin nutrition and exercise is the trial uh, is a basic uh, treatment regimen that has to be followed so can my child have any other disease the answer is as it is an autoimmune disease so autoimmune diseases can occur uh, together so we have to keep an eye on the hypothyroid whether the uh, we have to yearly check the thyroid status we have to do the celiac disease or addison's disease can he travel yes with all precautions avoid hypo and hyperglycemia have uh, we should know the blood sugar readings what the traveling is doing to what this is a important part that how to check insulin if the if i i am by is not damaged as insulin is a cold chain maintained product it is a very common problem that we encounter uh, it's a cold chain maintained product it might cross through six hands before it reaches the patient and maybe two people have not kept it inside the fridge so the ultimately we will get a damaged insulin so at present there is no way to check except if the same doses are not working which were initially working well this sudden change in control after change in cartridge should be bought from authorized dealers and it's a very common reason in poor control many a times especially in a child who was well controlled initially uh, this part was also covered in the panel how to store insulin it should be stored in a refrigerator 2 to 8 degrees bottle shelf never to be frozen if refrigerator is not available we can use an earthen pot so this is the way we keep it in an earthen pot there are two pots in the center pot we will keep the insulin and in the outside we can <coughs> i will show you this is the way there is a we can there is a wet sand in this there is an inner clay pot and an outer clay pot we put the water in this and as the water evaporates it pulls heat from the pot and this the temperature is maintained quite well now the child is there is an acceptance they have understood the disease now the child has to come to routine so shall we inform the school yes they should be informed about the child condition there are risk of hypoglycemia which the teacher should be aware of how to identify and manage whenever the child is going for sports extra precautions needs to be taken 
we can take the help of diabetic educators to empower the school teachers about dealing with some emergency whom to contact in case of emergency but this should not deter the child from all activities which others are doing he should be encouraged to participate in all the activities parents should involve the caregivers and school personnel in children in child diabetes care and teach them about the blood sugar testing and insulin administration so the they should be they should not only worry they should negotiate we have to keep the have to be prepared they have to be prepared for hypoglycemia so it takes a team to support their dreams but it's not impossible now once the treatment has started few year, few months or six months down the line the uh, they meet more people they meet more people for type 1 uh, with diabetes and then they have the questions like <clears throat> shall we start the child on pump will it make the life easier we can forget about the disease and just relax changing the cannula only once in 3 days yes you can child start the child on pump but you cannot forget the disease you have to keep monitoring and in fact monitoring could be even more when you have started the pump so you can start the pump any point but aggressive monitoring taking care is not less blood sugars needs to be monitored as previously uh, there is a uh, continuous glucose monitoring is needed only if when we are using the pump no it's not the answer continuous glucose monitoring can be it's an important tool for any insulin administration so i cannot drive he can if control is good there are no chances of hypoglycemia they cannot delay the meals they cannot take they should take breaks in between keep checking their blood sugars bring treatments so it's a they have to be cautious about it but they can do it food with labels are are they safe can the can the child take it home prepared balanced diet remains the key labeled foods are rich in fat not recommended they are expensive and can cause diarrhea also so now is what should do when we my child is sick when to visit the doctor sick day guidelines as well, as was discussed insulin important thing is insulin not to be stopped more aggressive checking to be done urine ketones to be done at home and chance there are chances of precipitation of diabetic ketoacidosis so prevent dehydration continue feeding treat nausea rest and uh, avoid exertion frequent blood sugar checking check ketones check schedule insulin extra insulin to be needed so there are indications of hospitalization like poor oral acceptance and excessive vomiting so what are the targets blood sugar it is less than 7% for children adolescent and young adults with diabetes who have access to the comprehensive care but targets need to be individualized based upon the child who can articulate hypoglycemia has history of hypoglycemic unawareness has access to analog insulin advanced technologies and regular sugar monitoring So what all the organs can be damaged it can affect any organ of the body like brain eyes heart kidneys nerves of the hands so uh, how to avoid these complications we should have uh, maintain a good sugar sugar control maintaining hba1c next question is how frequently hba1c be to be done it has to be done three monthly how frequently the eye test and other tests to check for the organ dysfunction hba1c every three monthly fundus has to be done at baseline every yearly after 10 years or 3 to 5 years after onset urine microalbumin annually after 10 years or 5 years at the onset and serum lipids after 10 years or, or earlier if there are there is a family history now the question is the child has grown up they are thinking of child getting married will my child and future generation will inherit the disease if the one parent is affected if the mother is affected there is one in 25 uh, chances of the child having type 1 diabetes if she is less than 25 years and if it is more than 25 years it is 1 in 100 if the father is affected it is 1 in 17 chance if both the parents are affected it is 1 in 4 to 1 in 10 more if the parent has developed the disease less than 14 11 years so is type 1 diabetes only a disease of the pediatric population that adults are not affected it's not it, uh, they have an entity late onset diabetes of the young called lada which also present as an autoimmune disease it can present at 25 sometimes at 35 also and sometimes at 40 also these are those patients who are not very obese they develop diabetes and are not responding to oh we have to think of lada in such cases now the question is the child is growing up when to start giving responsibility of treatment to the children we have to start the transition usually not before eight o'clock we have to close you have to be closely monitoring especially adolescent time is very tricky the pay, the children are uh, we have to actively be involved in their day to day management of blood sugars 
so the take home messages is that diabetes is a chronic disease it can be well managed with good knowledge of the disease regular monitoring is important they can live a good life normal life play study choose a profession of their choice physicians should be compassionate in taking care and the needs of the children not only physical but also the psychological thank you uh thank you uh, dr richa uh, for beautiful insight and uh, the most important questions we uh, as a general practitioners face whenever a patient of diabetes comes even the patient is going to you but still the patient come back to me and then ask the question that is why this session was kept and it is very very important to know every questions because uh, the general practitioners are more connected with the patient than the endocrinologist and the patient may ask uh, more question to you rather than uh, the endocrinologist so uh, moving to next very interesting session uh, about the psychological impact of the diabetes and i request uh, chair persons to introduce the speaker the next speaker will be dr imran norani uh, Doctor, Mr. Harsh, can you display the slide? Doctor Imran Nurani. Okay, let me introduce Doctor Imran Nurani. Uh, Doctor Nurani is a uh, child psychologist at Sir Gangaram Hospital, and he is always associated with the IEP North Delhi in conducting uh, the program. Uh, uh and he is the, uh, runs the child development clinic at uh, and uh, Ch center for development behavior pediatrics at uh, sir gangaram hospital over to dr nurani thank you so much dr uh, dinesh for your invitation i'll be just sharing my slides Okay, so we'll be starting directly with the introduction. We all know that uh, this diabetes is uh, is the most common chronic endocrine pathology among children. All of you have by now discussed the medical aspect of it, management, and every other aspect except for the psychological part, which is most important as well as the medical as is the medical aspect of diabetes management. the thing that comes early in diabetes psychological management of diabetes is proper self control although the genetic biological and environmental factors play a role in the risk for and progression of diabetes behavioral cognitive and psychosocial management are crucial to prevention and improve health outcomes in many ways diabetes is one of a model disease for the sorry for the importance of biopsychosocial approach to healthcare this self control may be difficult definitely resulting in children and adolescents and their families suffering diverse psychosocial complications there is an inverse relationship between self control and psychosocial complications the main problems being being anxiety depression where adolescents are 2 to 3 point 2 to 3 times more likely to have mental health problems families are initially affected as was uh, discussed by dr richa as well that there is a state of shock there are feelings of distress there are feelings of anger and then ultimately why us only and all these things have to be taken care of by the proper counseling of patient family as well as the child expired clinical guidelines and practice to 2018 discuss about the psychological care of children and adolescents with type 1 diabetes and they recommend that children who are having diabetes need psychological management because they are having the comorbidities of depression diabetes distress disordered eating behaviors cognitive functioning and school performance impaired as discussed by dr subrata day as well parental distress coping and demographic factors as well as stress and coping factors affecting their quality of life including resiliency psychosocial behavioral interventions studies are there to improve the glycemic control 
diabetes management behaviors and psychosocial functioning. So we need to understand what exactly are the concerns. The concerns are these children who experience diabetes are having higher rates of depression and other emotional problems than the general population. You can see a rise of almost uh, five to 10 units, plus minus five of adolescents who are having diabetes with having depression, which translates into two to three times that is found in the general population of children. One possible link between what explains these depressive symptoms are related to poor diabetes health outcomes is the self-efficacy. Those with higher depressive symptoms have low self-efficacy and the belief that they cannot control the diabetes. If you feel a lack of control, it can lead to making you unhealthy decisions, definitely again resulting to the cognitive impairment under stress. Finally, depression and depressive symptoms not only relate to negative disease outcomes, but are also related to poor overall functioning and low perceived quality of life. So the signs which you can see in a patient when you are doing a clinical uh, workup can be in terms of sadness, apathy, distractibility, lethargy, sleep, disturbances, appetite changes, low motivation, and not participating in the previously enjoyed things. So for young children, these symptoms are usually noticed as irritability, anger, tantrums, aches and pains, which result in stomach aches and headaches and ultimately result in dropping out from the school and classes. When these symptoms occur, it is the time to talk to a health trail professional about them. In some cases, many families may need to speak out mental health, may need to speak out, seek out for mental health services to talk more thoroughly with a professional who can help them develop some positive coping strategies as well. For people with diabetes, there is also a risk of developing this diabetes distress, which includes negative feelings that are directly related to diabetes. For example, feeling extreme frustration with blood sugars, feeling bogged down by all daily management of tasks and feeling isolated with diabetes experience. Prolonged diabetes distress can lead to diabetes burnout, which is a term used uh, for encompassing the feelings of being unable, unable to cope with the diabetes. There may be other general depressive symptoms which can be there on a regular basis as well. So although less prevalent than depressive and distressive symptoms, there is definitely anxiety which also takes toll on young children, adolescents, as well as their family, which is between 13 to 17% of the patients with diabetes. Anxiety definitely can take toll on children because there are fears of specific diabetes events like future hypoglycemic episodes, which Dr. Richard discussed that we need to pre-counsel all the kids, maybe the school people, as well as the parents, how to communicate and how to uh, make arrangements for their children in the school time. Parents also you lose a lot of sleep, checking overnight blood sugars of their kid, kids, and they worry a lot about their management as well. For the person and people living with diabetes, any kind of increasing anxiety is negatively related to the quality of high glycemic control, making diabetes self-management more difficult. Constantly worrying can weigh on children and at worst can lead to the feeling of helplessness and being unable to manage these diabetes. Subsequently, when a child or an adolescent or his family group may move into a new balance that they have to maintain between good self-control and adherence to the treatment as well, or deepen individual or group disorders, which may reappear, especially in adolescence. So a potentially, definitely, it is a potentially life-threatening condition. It must be having some psychological impact as well as some of I discussed early. And that of the diabetes is profound. If the care regimen is complex, the impact is greater in terms of financial loss, misunderstandings, external influences, for example, patients being accepted or rejected by the community as was discussed earlier as well, and the needs imposed by the disease itself. Family members, this is the first step that they go through any, any kind of uh, stress any, or any kind of loss in the family is exactly like what a person or a father or a mother of a child of diabetes goes through, and that is grief, which progresses from anger, denial, and then they finally bargain which can result in some into depression and finally the resolution or acceptance of the problem. So childhood diabetes means that there is no food supposed to be consumed without understanding. 
the carb carbohydrate carbohydrate levels how much insulin to take waiting for an effect and problem solving if numbers are too high and too low too low for an average person it seems to be an all right phenomena but when you have this additional uh, thing and additional uh, things to manage for a child it becomes a real burden on your psyche many children report feeling singled out and different from their peers school and academics is a trouble for them so i'll directly come to the neurocognitive functioning and school functioning of children with diabetes uh, uh, type 1 diabetes as discussed uh, by dr subrata as well that there are subtle neurocognitive deficits and pathological brain changes in children and adolescents with type 1 diabetes iq scores intelligence scores are typically well within the average they range between 85 to 110 but they are significantly lower than those of the healthy controls the specific skills you as a pediatrician or an endocrinologist have to look out for are these which are information processing which results in attention memory processing speed which are also in turn related to academic skills executive functioning which involves planning organizational problem solving and mental flexibility the some of the lit literature and meta analytic reviews reveal a significant relationship between early disease onset and cognitive neurocognitive deficits with attention memory and learning and executive skills for those children who are diabetic who have been developing diabetes prior to 5 and 6 years of age so the school setting definitely presents a big challenge for parents with the diabetes and we need to manage the anxiety of a child by giving them individual help there as well so children who develop diabetes prior to 6 or 7 years of age and those with a history of chronic hyperglycemia appear at a particular risk of academic underachievement as well this is very very mandatory important thing to understand that what and how they are doing on different neurocognitive neurocogn assessments together with appropriate educational interventions to all those children who have unexplained academic underachievement or difficulties managing the problem solving demands inherent to the optimal disease management how it affects family and social support the literature says that consistently it has demonstrated that family factors are integral to the management of diabetes in children and how because the studies show high levels of these family cohesion authoritarian parenting which focuses on the reinforcement agreement about the diabetes management responsibilities between uh, between parents supportive behaviors parental monitoring of the diabetes management and collaborative problem solving are associated with better regimen adherence and glycemic control family conflict diffusion of the responsibilities and over or under involvement in diabetes management related to the child's developmental levels and abilities have been associated to worsen the regimen adherence and glycemic control family conflict definitely is one of another factor which uh, related to this blood glucose monitoring have been associated with depression it is important to know that many pa parental psychological distress is in in parents of children with uh, diabetes social support is needed for parents as well as children now we'll be coming to the stress and coping mechanisms that these people uh, children or parents with diabetes go through considerable research has demonstrated that important role of stress and coping in predicting psychosocial adjustment as well as glycemic control among youth with type 1 diabetes daily stressors faced by younger children are usually related to friends and peers and siblings as well and their coping behaviors include choosing an alternative activity and taking some personal responsibility there is a reciprocal relationship between active coping and better glycemic control and how it affects the quality of life definitely it is a center central outcome of diabetes care in general children with diabetes rate their own quality of life as similar to healthy peers but parents tend to rate the child's quality of life somewhat lower except for those who are below 5 to 7 years of age because there is not much understanding in terms of the disease in those children less favorable quality of life is appears to be with the youth uh, youth's perception that diabetes is upsetting difficult to manage and stressful as well as fear of hyperglycemia 
psychosocial and behavioral interventions are recommended by ipsad as well and how what are what are the most important things are family based procedures behavioral modifications such as goal setting problem solving self monitoring use of the positive re reinforcements and behavioral contracts support to mental uh, parental communications family re restructuring and appropriately shared responsibility for diabetes management have improved the regimen adherence student studies of behavioral family system therapies with diabetes management targeting the diabetes specific uh, behavioral problems and training in behavioral contracting techniques have shown improvements in family conflict resolution as well tailoring how do we manage psychological interventions in diabetes how do we do that we have to go with some tailor made intervention plans for these children as well as families psychosocial interventions improve control and other health and behavioral outcomes but opportunities definitely remain to develop more targeted and robust interventions what is the module what is the modus operandi in behavioral management or psychosocial management of children of diabetes is based on these three theories of behavioral intervention and these are the most frequently employed theories are by bandura kozak and uh, stems which is social cognitive theory family systems theory and social ecological models how what does social cognitive theory rely on is that it posits that an individual self efficiency or confidence in one's ability to compete in particular behaviors and outcome expectancies or the positive or the negative consequences of each behavior one anticipates influence health behaviors and the greater self efficacy helps youth exert sufficient effort to master and maintain diabetes care behaviors family systems definitely is in context of family interactions family factors have been demonstrated to be powerful predictors of child health outcomes across pediatric chronic conditions social ecological model has to do it is a dynamic reciprocal interactions among factors at multiple levels which involves the hierarchy of child family community and society Uh, which will include uh, his uh, parents relations and then school settings social friends and uh, these derived from sem only the model of social ecological risk factors for special healthcare plan needs has been uh, jotted out which outlines how multiple systems influence child's disease self management behaviors and health comes and identify the potential intervent interventions at each point the this is how we have we have to sum it up like social cognitive theory which is like teaching i'll be just summing it up is like teaching management tasks and uh, then observation learning of the parents and having modeling from the parents important one is this cognitive restructuring for example a child is hopeless that he or uh, she may be having some future hypoglycemic episodes this is where this uh, cognitive therapy of cognitive restructuring and counseling a child comes into play similarly uh there are other skill training programs which have uh, which have been very effective when a small average size population was taken into account which uh, this uh, skill training programs in include the progr programs which teach coping problem solving and stress management for the children and individuals with uh, diabetes family interventions have to be the center or the theme of all the psychosocial managements which uh, can be also described as family teamwork and behavioral family systems therapy so overall if we understand uh, the thing is like it the psycho psychosocial or psychological aspects of diabetes have to do with individual it has to do with parents it has to do with uh, friends and families it has to do with uh, school and other coordinates around the child this one important example of intervention of multi systemic intervention which is cognitive behavior therapy which we have used in some children with uh, diabetes has worked very well i'm just giving you an example here of cognitive behavior therapy for management of fear of hypoglycemia in children how do we do that for example we determine the actual and perceived frequency and severity of hypoglycemic episodes ask the person about his or her concern in de developing these episodes during the day as well as night normalizing the fear responses empathizing with the individual and asking for permission to look for the possibility of reducing the fear 
and ultimately we determine the person's com comfort zone for glucose levels and use the gradual approach to nudge that safe uh, what exactly he logically thinks and what exactly is the reality this is how cbt can be applied on these children so this is these are the two components of cognitive behavioral therapy one is cognitive component making them understand that what they think or what they have illogical rational beliefs or something about some other things about this diabetes and what are the behaviors that manifest because of those beliefs so we help them in record keeping we tell them to engage in uh, different behaviors of not overthinking about the same and uh, finally this technology and uh, m health interventions as we look at the current pandemic situation also it can serve as one of the important means of outreach to these children and adolescents key messages i'll be just winding it up is the experience of living with diabetes is often associated with concerns specific to illness and can cause conditions like diabetes distress insulin psychological insulin resistance and persistent fear of hypoglycemic episodes people living with diabetes are depressive and depressive disorders are at increased risk for earlier all cause mortality compared to people living with diabetes without a history of depression all individuals with diabetes should be regularly screened for the presence of diabetes distress as well as symptoms of common psychiatric disorders compared to those of diabetes only individuals with diabetes and mental health concerns have decreased participation in diabetes self care a decreased quality of life increased functional imp impairment increased risk for complications associated with diabetes and increased health care concerns the cognitive behavior therapy patient centered approaches motivational interviewing stress management coping skill training family therapy and collaborative case management should be incorporated into the primary care self management skills educational interventions that facilitate adaptation to diabetes addressing the co occurring mental health issues reducing diabetes related stress fear of hypoglycemia and psychological insulin resistance are all helpful in successfully managing diabetes and this is for people with diabetes that we need to assure them that it can be burdensome and anxiety provoking with constant care demanding taking a psychological toll on you as a result many ex people experience these symptoms it is also associated with a lot of emotional burden why me only how long and how much i have to do for managing my diabetes and mood and anxiety disorders are particularly common in people with diabetes eating sleeping stress related disorders should be taken care of mental health disorders can affect your ability to cope with and take and care of your diabetes it is just as important to look after your mental health as is your physical health people diagnosed with serious mental health issues such as uh, depression uh, bpd uh, bipolar disorder and uh, schizophrenia are at higher risk of developing these disorders so whatever references i have used here uh, i can uh, email it to you you can directly contact me on this number i'll be sending you the references and full papers for the same thank you so much back to you dr rashmi richa and dr dinesh uh thank you uh... Dr. Imran, for uh, such a beautiful insight, and I request the chairpersons to make some comments or uh, can take the questions if possible. Yes, indeed, psychologist is a important member of the team which helps in the management of childhood diabetes, along with pediatrician, pediatric endocrinologist, and dietitian. So. we have time for questions dr dinesh yeah this is the last session i think we can take the questions so uh, i think there is a question how to help parents deal with the stress especially parents of toddlers with diabetes when the child cries before and after every dose see uh, we uh, we have a concept of desensitization okay gradually exposing to the fear definitely a child whenever Uh, he understands that he has to take a dose for that we need to pre counsel a child there is one thing which is called a pairing and pairing with a positive reinforcement 
for example why this fear is there is because he understand he or she understands that it is a stressful situation for a parent as well which is transferred to the child as well so how do we do it we do positive pairing with the reinforcer use the favorite items of the child do it at a time when he understands that it has been visually graphed for example that you have to take the doses twice in a day you give a visual presentation to the child that these are the timings and when you are done with it after what follows that behavior is important that how he or she will take it in future for example if the last dose was given and the child got the reinforcer in terms of his toy in terms of his uh, like screen time little modification is in his in his diet definitely there will be no ever so stomas associated with the dosage dr pavan you want to say uh, something sir may the really excellent talk uh, by the dr imran nurani the Thank psychological you. issues are very big in the diabetes type 1 diabetes i think this is a excellent talk for that thank okay, you sir thanks thank you so much so oh, i don't think there are any further questions uh, so with this uh, we come to the end of the day 3 of the endocon and it was really a successful day 3 also uh, i am re- ex- uh, extremely sorry that uh, for the last moment we have to change the ids and the webinar ids because some technical problems out there but despite all this we could start on time also i think that it was just 5 minutes late it was uh, not much uh, delay and uh, i i am really thankful to the all the chairpersons the faculty the speakers uh, for the their wonderful sessions uh, today tomorrow also we will be having a very very interesting session especially the miscellaneous topics which are not covered in this we will be having uh, those topics tomorrow also we will be having a very interesting uh, uh, workshop that is a hormonal uh, investigations and uh, their uh, interpretations uh, at 1 uh, pm uh, tomorrow so all of you are welcome and over to dr richa if you want to take some make some comments uh, thank you dr dinesh uh, thanks a lot i will really like to thank all the delegates and all the panelists all the faculty and dr imran also it was a very useful session and the people who really dealing with the diabetic patients can realize how psychologically issues are there and uh, they definitely affect the management of the child greatly so we have to keep their morals high that's the main thing that then the things happen true and uh, after winding up i hope the sessions were useful and you can use them all these in your routine clinical practice uh, and next day tomorrow there are other sessions as dr dinesh has already mentioned so do join us tomorrow and have a great evening thank you thank you thank you everyone thank you thanks thank you thanks all